All right, how's it going? My name is Matt Barr. You're listening to episode 89 of the Looking Sideways Action Sports Podcast. It's the show where I try and uncover the most fascinating stories in action sports and other related endeavours, as you probably know by now. Thanks for listening to this one, and I hope you enjoy it. So my guest for this week is the great Steve Douglas, skateboarder and, well, entrepreneur, I guess you'd say. Steve was, yet again, one of the names on my original ideal guests list when I started the podcast back in 2017. He's one of those legendary figures in UK skateboarding, basically, who's had this incalculable influence, whether as a pro skater or latterly in industry kingpin, I guess you'd say, in a career that spanned almost four decades. Now, my own introduction to Steve, like a lot of people listening, I imagine, came through Rad Magazine, another influence that's loomed large throughout the history of the Looking Sideways podcast. Steve was the author of the eponymous column, which in the era of... uh, magazines and VHS films was basically the hotline to the US scene for anybody in the UK around that time. I'm talking like mid 80s to early 90s. You basically read that if you wanted to know what was going on because Steve was out there um, living it basically. And he also influenced me in another way, although I didn't really get that at the time. Basically, I started skating in around 1991. A new deal, the company Steve started with Andy Howe, Paul Schmidt, and others was my way into skateboarding basically useless wooden toys and 1281 were the first films i really got into on my own other than like hocus pocus and all the stuff that you that you end up watching when you get into it and basically the whole aesthetic and ethos around new deal and skaters like ed templeton andy howell and all the rest was what originally got me hooked on skateboarding and led me to do what i've been doing for the last almost 30 years really So when I saw Steve, Andy and the rest would be reissuing New Deal this year to celebrate the brand's 30-year anniversary, I thought I'd uh, chase up Steve to see if if he'd be up for coming on the show, which is how this one came about. We were introduced by our mutual friend Dan Adams at Read and Destroy, and uh, we hooked it up. We met in Brixton at the end of May 2019, sat down and recorded this podcast. Naturally, we talked extensively about the entire New Deal reissue which I've got to say has been really brilliantly delivered. But the thing is, this is only one tiny part of Steve's ridiculously eventful career, as I would later discover. Before speaking to Steve for this one, I asked a few mutual friends for the heads up, one of whom came back and said, Steve, well, he's a force of nature. From the start, he seems to have been driven by an absolute love of skateboarding and skate culture and by driving a work ethic that has enabled him to achieve some truly great things and influence a generation and a scene by sheer force of will, really. No media in your hometown. Create a zine like Steve did. Want to push yourself as a skater to become as good as you can. Move west, become one of the first UK skateboarders to do that and end up as one of the most important figures in the industry. Not happy with the way skaters are being treated by their existing sponsors. Start off one of the first truly skater-led companies and turn it into the one, of the one of the most influential brands ever. I could be here all day, to be honest, but the point is that throughout his life and deeds, Steve Douglas is probably the ultimate example of the DIY ethos that's been such a crucial part of skate culture. And he's got a legit claim to be one of the most quietly influential skateboarders of the last 30-odd years. Not bad for a Chelsea fan from North London. So yeah, I was pretty stoked to get Steve on the show and pick his brains for an hour or so. It's really not often you get to pay tribute to people that have had such an influence on your life, which as I often say is one of the best parts about doing this whole show for me, really. I'll be back with more at the end. But in the meantime, here's me and Steve Douglas. New deal. Enjoy. So I'm with Steve. How are you doing, Steve? Very good. Very yeah. good. Yeah. I, nice to be here. Nice to be back in uh, Brixton. Yeah. Back in London. When was the last time you were in Brixton? Ooh, okay, that's a great question. Probably 35 years ago, 36 years ago. Well, I mean, for thinking for going skateboarding. But yeah. I've been to the academy a bunch of times, but I probably haven't been to the academy for 25 years. The last time was uh, probably seeing Stiff Little Fingers. Because I, I spoke to Dan Adams. Yeah. And he was like, he's like, where are you meeting him? I was like, I'm meeting him in Brixton. He's like, Brixton? 
Stephen Brixton. Can't, <laughs> can't, can't imagine that. <laughs> but yeah, thanks yeah, for coming to, down. You, you used to come here all the time on the way to you know, going to Crystal Palace, get off of Brixton, get the 2B. I think it was the 2B up to Crystal Palace and then skate down. Yeah. So how long have you been over? Because you're over a lot, right? But you. Yeah, I'm over. I'm pretty much over every six weeks, eight weeks. Yeah, right. I didn't realise it was that frequently. Yeah, yeah. And then you've coincided this with, obviously, there's, there's been Street League this weekend. Yeah, which was, in, which was incredible. Yeah. So you went and had a look at that? You went, you went and checked that out? Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, I, it's, um, I don't often go to those sort of contests. Those contests aren't really my cup of tea. I prefer to just watch them on, 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 online and everything. But it was really great to watch it and just see the level of consistency. It was just absolutely mind-blowing. And the women's final, um, I didn't see the qualifying, um, but the women's final was just an absolute mind-blower. I mean, yeah. absolutely, again, really super consistent, doing tricks absolutely to perfection. It wasn't like, oh, that's a girl. She's trying her best to do the trick as good as the guys. It was like, no, that was as good as a backside Smith grind as anyone can do. You yeah. know, and this little girl, this little Brazilian girl, probably, you know, she looked like she was three feet tall, but she just, <laughs> she was just incredible. So that was a big, 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 big eye opener. Well, and then the, the consistency is actually ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, it is because, I mean, I, it just seemed like a little while ago in 1994 where you'd go to a demo and the parents would be asking when the pros are going to skate. And I'd be like, no, no, they've been skating for the last four hours. You know, they haven't landed a trick. So to see the level of under that pressure and to be able to do trick, 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 it was just, it was just fantastic to see. It was really, really good. It's, and it's, it's also turned into a good kind of gathering of the tribes as well, I think, for, for UK skateboarding, hasn't it? Yeah. You know, there's a lot, lot of people around and good reunion for everybody. Yeah, I think Mark and Ben did a great job on the, uh, yeah. doing, doing all that all over the weekend. And we had the... We had the Ben tribute, which was um, really, really well done. Really moving, is, actually. Yeah, and uh, Kevin Parrott got a shout out for him. I don't know Kevin, but he came through in a big, big time. And yeah. SLS really were very, very helpful putting that together. And Mark and Ben, that, that was not an easy thing to do. And they did that with perfection. So it was, uh, it was, it was. Uh, I wish we hadn't had to do it, but uh, yeah. we did. And I think he, we did a, we did a good job. The Victoria, you're wearing the badge, aren't you, actually? The Victoria yeah. Park. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely tribute, that, isn't it? Yeah, it was very, very good. Because you can all, you know, you're already just seeing it everywhere, aren't you? And, oh, you it know. was incredible. I mean, again, I, I, I try to stay away from social media for, you know, for a couple of days and just stay away from it. But when I did get it on, it was just like back to back to back to back. And, you know, Ben was a, absolutely amazing person. That, that we Everybody that met him felt like he was their best friend, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was, it was, it was uh, truly, truly, truly tragic so yeah but lovely tribute yeah, yeah. Lovely tribute yeah so how long are you sticking around for you got a little yeah little bit of time a, couple, in town. a couple of weeks i might be here until we got a big uh there's going to be a big primitive demo right uh coming up in london at the end of july which is going to be massive and probably people don't know about that yet but it's going to be it's going to be a big big thing for big weekend on the last weekend of july so i'm going to help out uh, organize that a little bit while yeah. i'm here um and then we've got some trade shows coming up, one in uh, Bristol and one in Manchester. So yeah. I might go back to America for a c couple of weeks and then come back or, or just stay here on through. So Yeah. But obviously the main thing you've been um, busying yourself with is, is New Deal, 30 years. So um, how's that all going? Because it's been, it looks like it's been rolled out pretty nicely, you know. It's, it, it's been a bit of a master plan that you've been working on. Yeah, it's been a long time. We, we, we talked about it Um Three or four years ago, I spoke to Paul and Paul's like, Steve, I don't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. Because a lot of people have been asking us like, hey, the Santa Cruz re reissues are doing really well. Powell's really doing, when are you going to bring New Deal back? Right, because it is a bit of a thing these days, isn't it? Like the kind of nostalgia, well, yeah, like reissue I mean, market. I, as, I, as I know, you know, some of the Powell and Santa Cruz, their best-selling boards have been yeah. their reissues, right? So it's just like, well, that would be kind of fun to do again. And, and for us, it was more about telling the stories. But when I spoke to Paul, Paul's like, I don't have the bandwidth to do it. I hadn't even spoke to Andy at that point about it. And then he said to me, Steve, we don't have the masters. I don't know where the master tapes was. Oh. Right. And I'm like, well, if we don't have the masters, then we're not bringing it back because if we don't have the video, then we don't have, a, you know, it's, it was the, the cornerstone of the company. Was yeah, it was a video. real, real video-based brand, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, when we came out, we actually started the brand um, with a video before you saw the product. The product yeah. was actually in the back of the video, um, which is funny enough, was actually set up for Bod because I wanted to get Bod as being part of New Deal. Right. And I, he, I remember him coming into Paul's house and I'd laid out all the boards and all the shirts and said, hey, Bod, you can be a part of this. Right. Which is pretty funny. And right. he didn't. But that's when they, I, I took those boards in the back of Paul's garden and, and did a, a film that. And that was in the part of the promo video that we did. Yeah. Which is one of the, which you've put on the YouTube and you've yeah. issued as well, right? Yeah. So. And so, so there was just, I didn't think about it anymore. And then I saw a post on, on, um, on social media saying we found the masters. I think it was a picture of Neil had showing all the masters and I'm like, okay, game on. Right. So then I approached Paul just about a year and a half ago or a year ago. And I just said, Paul, you know what? 30 years is coming up. If we don't do it now, 
we're never going to do it, you know? And so I think it's like now or never. And I go, I've got the time. and I do have the bandwidth to do this right now. And it'd be fun. I'd be a fun side project for me to do. And so he said, okay, sounds good. Speak to Andy. So I spoke to Andy and Andy was totally down for it. But Andy was just like, hey, I want to do this, but I also want to be able to do some different stuff than we do. Just don't just do reissues. And I'm sure. like, hey, we're on the same page. Yeah. Let's have some fun with it. And, and we have had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, well, you can tell that you've planned it really nicely. You know what I mean? Because it's a good mix of nostalgia and also updating it for people that might not know the story so well. Yeah, well, we originally started, we were thinking about just doing the uh, the 15-minute promo video because that was like the, the lost video. Right. right because if you go if you went online you could never find that video. i never saw it it was only it was on it was used to swim toys and it was 1281 yeah and then i remember seeing one video and it said hey there's a little a kind of easter egg at the end there's a whole video on the end of it and i'm, I'm realizing i'm going hey no one's no one's even seen this 15 minute promo or they don't really know it exists right so i'm like if we do this originally we, the idea was to do a 15 minute documentary on the making of of new deal uh so a 15 minute documentary on a 15 minute on the promo video right and that was the basic concept and then we were just going to do the first layer of board, uh, round of boards and then be done. And that was it. That was going to be our 30-year tribute. Right. Now it's grown into, now we're going to do the first three years. Yeah. And then we're going to do the first three videos, which are the videos that I actually personally edited, which is a funny story in itself. Because I'm the biggest, I, I mean, I have a hard time with, <laughs> with anything electrical. And the, the thought that I actually edited those videos still blows my mind. Right. Because uh, I'm, I'm absolutely useless when it comes to computers and anything electrical. Um, but it's amazing what, what you can do with focus and determination. Sure. But, um, so, yeah, so we decided to make it a bigger project, uh, really focus on between 90 and 92 for those first three videos, but then also include all the riders that ever rode for New Deal because right. I didn't want anybody to feel left out. But, you know, and in the future, maybe we'll keep going over to the later years, but we really want to focus on what I kind of call the glory years yeah. of, of New Deal between 90 and 92. Did yeah. you, were you still in touch with everyone? at the time not everybody but a lot of people yeah you know a lot of people and so, were you able to track everyone down yeah like 95 percent of the people we tracked down and everybody was so cool it's been some of the greatest phone calls been, about catching up with yeah everybody. that must have been i mean taking a, taking a long time you yeah, know what i mean yeah. like 30 minute an hour conversations with some of the guys yeah you know but it's been really 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 good catching up with them all yeah it's been yeah really good and because i like the new my new deal story thing is great yeah, that was paul's idea and that was uh it was brilliant Love yeah because you've been um, using like shots from just randoms haven't you like people that probably a bit like me just grew up with it knew what it was yeah we want it know. to be we want it to be to everybody i mean one of the things that me andy and paul want to do we want to we want to tell the stories there's certain things that we did around that time that no one knew that was just oh they just you know and um which we'll hopefully get into a little bit a little bit later but i want to tell those stories andy wants to tell his part of the stories paul wants to tell his stories and then the writers tell their stories i mean yeah. the writers are telling their new deal stories and we're like learning from them going oh my goodness i didn't know that right you know what i mean guys thinking that we're going to get their schmidt sticks box and it turned up and it was this new brand called the new deal right you know i mean i didn't know that that's hilarious but i mean you know you just our memories remember things and forget things you know and all but it's been it's been really really good working with the team and that's made it all good and then the comments on social media have been have been fantastic so it's, it's been a lot of hard work um but it's been a lot of fun has that surprised you the reaction because it has been universally positive hasn't it you it's know blown me absolutely blown me away were I you mean, expecting had, that or no i wasn't expecting it i mean i had i had dan from escapist who i don't know and by respect to shop and what they do uh where, where, where they where they are in america and you know i got this message from him just saying and he just did this really great post and i'm like hey dan i uh messaged him i said hey dan can i can i, can I speak to you and I, I got on the phone to him and he's just like, Steve, he goes, New Deal was such an impact in my life. He goes, yeah. I was having, he had some, some medical problems, I think, uh, whatever it was. And his mum bought him 1281. And he's like, that 1281 video helped me through one of the roughest times of my life through a summer. And I'm just like almost in tears, you know, of thinking that a video that we all made together, you know what I mean, impacted this person that has, an, you know, a big part of where skateboarding is and, you know, kind of like the gatekeeper of, of skateboarding. And yet I'm having that message with him. I mean, it was just awesome. Yeah, that must be super gratifying. Yeah, it's been, it's been, and there's been loads of those stories. You know, I'm team writers too, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, me and my mates grew up with that film, you know, basically. Watched that every day for a year, you know, yeah. before we went skateboarding. And useless wooden toys as well. I mean, you know, they, you can see from the, from the reaction from people, like they, they meant a lot to people, didn't they? Yeah, they basically. did. Basically. And also like, super influential for that period of skateboarding you know like the, the skaters that you had on the team and the the style you know the whole thing it's like proper encapsulate it's that era now doesn't it when you look back yeah i mean i, I it's, it's funny i think i'm the only person in the era that didn't like the power videos really right right <laughs> it's an old thing to say but well, and when i say that i was so that's like heresy i wanted to see <laughs> i wanted to see like you know i respected 
all the power videos, don't get me wrong, but what I didn't like was when like I could see the video going into the wheel and seeing the bearings spin. Yeah, right. I'm like, I want to wanna see Tony Hawk. I want to know how far he traveled, yeah. how high he went. That's what I want to see. You know, and like, so I liked sort of like, the, the, you know, the complete reverse of that was H Street, right? I mean, H Street went from just the, just the, you know, it was terrible video quality. Yeah, the I actually skateboarding. I actually watched Hocus Pocus again recently, was just and it's it, incredible. It, the, the skating's amazing, but yeah, it, it looks pretty sharp. And their sales, their sales double, 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 but, double, double, but double, double. But again, again those fil- those films like were next generation Hocus Pocus. They were like again just like the, the few years before, just massive, weren't they? Yeah, like, no, so it was, influential. It was, it was a very interesting time, you yeah. know. And I think you've got to give credit to Steve Rocco because Steve Rocco changed that whole industry and i think he did it i don't think he could do that now the, the stuff that sure. Rocco did but what he did around that time he opened the door and and from that a lot of the skate skater run companies came through because that, up until that point they really weren't skater run i mean paul schmidt said to me just recently he's like hey the big five guys he goes i never once skated with any of them right right never once right you know? which is talent which, really isn't it you know and so you know new deal was a good was was the right time for us with the right name and uh, it all seemed to work well then and so bringing it back to tell those stories and uh and get everybody involved you know the collectors the artists yeah uh the riders the the, the guys that were influenced it now that are a big still part in the industry i mean a lot of the distributors out there right now um that are selling New Deal are there, was their first brand they ever sold right. as a distributor. So you've got those relationships as well to, so, to reconnect with. Yeah, so so on that point, like when when's it out? When can people start buying it? Well, we're pre-booking. We just finished pre-booking last Friday. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to go through. Um, we're going to be delivering that at the end of uh, September, beginning okay. of October. So that's a tough thing about today, right? Because yeah. everybody's seen it and, every, and you've got to keep the story alive until the product arrives, you know? Yeah. People could be like, oh, the product's already old, you know? It's like, well, it hasn't shipped yet. So... That's a, that is the one of the problems with today's the way they sell. And we knew that was going to happen. As soon as the catalogs go out, we knew it's going to be uploaded. People are going to talk about it. Right. So the, 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 not the battle is, the fun part of it is really is telling the stories up until when the product hits, which is going to be in September. Yeah. Well, we'll get to, I reckon we can, let's save the story okay. for how you got into it. A new yeah, we'll deal. Yeah, yeah. Cause, but there's a, there's a big story before that, obviously. Um, and you're massively associated with London and the London skate scene. So can we can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. like the early early years, because you know, when did you? How did you sort of discover skateboarding? When when was this? I remember seeing it on John Craven's news round. And um, wow, that's quite an English reference. And I, uh, <laughs> I think they were skating in Germany or something like that. And I went to school the next. I like like sex the next day. You know, I mean, it could have been a month after or yeah. Whatever, but it seemed when, like when it would this have been? This is in uh, in Pinner, right? And. Um, the, the, it was a year, but I was a year below, so it was like I was, I think, eleven, and the older boys were all, were all twelve, and um, I patiently waited while this guy let everybody ride the board, right? And right then they go, "Hey, can I have a ride?" And the guys like, "Fuck off," you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're the year below, you know, yeah. no, you can't. And I just was just like, and right then it helped me out so much because I'm like, I'm going to get a board and I'm going to show you. And so I pestered my mum and dad for a long, long, long time, and, right? You know, long story short. Um, they, they, they said, hey, we'll get you a board, we'll get you a skateboard, but don't let, let it be a five-minute wonder, or it's going to be a five-minute wonder, and, and obviously it wasn't. So I got hold of a plastic board from a sporting goods store. Worst terrible-looking board you've ever had. What, well, like classic sort of thin little thing? Terrible yeah. wheels, you know, semi-precision bear, bearings. I remember just clearly uh, having to send the wheels back because they, they, they kind of basically fell off. So I had right. to send these wheels back, and it took, it seemed like months to get these bo- uh, wheels back, and I finally got them back, and then they did the same thing again. And then I went to a skate shop and saw, I uh, found the skate shop, right? right? And they had red Kryptonics. So then I put these red Kryptonics on it with, with, with precision bearings. And it was just a game changer. Right. Because I've been, before I've been rattling around the streets, hitting a rock and being like smashing my face and going, oh, wow, welcome to skateboarding, you know? I love it. Uh, and then I got these red Kryptonics. I remember pushing at Pinner and I ended up in like in the next town, North of the Hills, <laughs> not having to push again. And it was just incredible. It's like I was on, you know, you know as a snowboarder, right? You know, it's like learning to ride on, on ice. And yeah, having a powder day. For yeah, yeah, right. And it, the powder day was every day you rode on those wheels. So, yeah. So that was just an awesome uh, experience uh, uh, bringing into skateboarding. But then, you know, skateboarding died. And, you know, people call that the dark times of skateboarding. But it was actually probably the best times in skateboarding because... When, when are we talking, like early 80s then at this point? You know, that's a good question. I, I'd say, like to say 79. For okay. me, 79, it died. And then 80, we kind of transitioned over to where skateboarding had, you know, uh, ended up. And for, for me, it was a harrow. So we had a lot of guys 
that I was skating with around Northwood Hills area and there was other guys around Uxbridge area and I think they were all in pockets like me and they'd, everybody else had stopped but then we all ended up going to Harrow and so we formed like a little gang not really a gang but called, called the Harrow Boys yeah. but skateboarding was dead but we didn't care because we, we, we were skateboarding yeah. but I think for the looking back on it the industry what was tough for it is at that level before skateboarding died like I'd go to Rolling Thunder and watch those guys skate there and the level was just off the charts. It's funny, I bumped into Jeremy Henderson about 20 years ago and he was like, oh, yeah, I remember skating with you at Rolling Thunder. And I'm going, Jeremy, there's no way, you might have remembered me from Rolling Thunder, <laughs> but there's no way I was skating with you. I was a little kid just sitting there watching you guys yeah. in the pole bowl, you know? And then when Rolling Thunder went, all of those amazing skateboarders like Robbie Hunter and Jeremy Henderson and Jingles and Shabam and all these just rippers that we would see, they'd all gone. And so now it was just us, but we didn't cry about it. We just were like, hey, we, we, we're going to Harris Skate Park. We're gonna, you know, keep skating and, and having a good fun. And we had it was mainly all about fun and skating all the, all, all the time. But it was, um, you know, a bleak time, and there was no magazines at the time. You know? I was gonna say, there's no media, right? It's kind of yeah. Eight. Skateboarder had gone. Skateboard magazine had gone. Um, you know, what was it? Uh, uh, Action Now had come and gone. Yeah. And then there was just this little zine, uh, like a paper paper magazine, you know, yeah. like paper print magazine called Skate News. And then Thrasher came out, and that was huge to us, you know. And that was really, really gave everybody a, a shot in the arm, you know. And that was, that was uh, really good. And then the Americans started coming over for the Eurocana camps. And they'd always stop off in London, which was incredible. And we all got a great buzz from, you know, uh, Caballero and, and McGill coming over. And then, you know, um, Lance coming over. And, um, yeah, all, all those guys, Neil, Neil and Billy and, yeah. you know. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. So this, and this is an area where obviously people are kind of creating the scene, making zines, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we would go to Tim Layton Boyce, who I have utmost respect for. He said to me, he came up to me, he's like, Steve, you should skate, you should skate contests. And right. you, you and Mick and my friend Shedhead. And, and I said, I go, Mick and Shedhead, but no, not me. And he's like, no, no, but they have a junior division under, under, under 13 or under 14. Why did, why did you think no? Why, why? Well, I just didn't think I was good enough as compared right. to those guys. And I was just like, no, I, you know, but then I don't, don't, you know, they, they got a younger version. So, um, so then we started going to these contests and then we, then we started meeting these other sort of tribes of skateboarders, you know what I mean? From Manchester and Liverpool and Andover. And it was just like, it was just amazing meeting these pockets of people. And it got to be a point where you knew every skateboarder in the UK. I mean, like you'd be taking a train up to, to Leeds and if you saw someone with a skateboard, you'd get off the train and go, and, who are you? Where do you skate? Because you knew everybody it was so small. Yeah, you could kind of, you know, even like a pair of trainers, a pair of vans, or whatever, and it's like you basically were like, "Well, okay, who's that guy?" <laughs> well, I went into a job centre, funny enough, in Harrow, and I saw this guy with a pair of red vans, and I walked up to him. I got the carriage. I go, "Do you skate?" And he goes, <laughs> "No." I go, "Well, those are sorry, but th those are skateboard shoes." He goes, "Oh, they expensive. I should, I should make, take better care of them." It was so <laughs> embarrassing, but that was what it was like in those days. You know, you saw someone wearing vans. And well, it was that rare. Well, they were a skateboarder. Yeah, which is kind of funny to think think back now, basically. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so how's embarrassing the, to say. So how's the, how's the contest go? Well, it's funny enough, I won all of them. Um, <laughs> but it sounds better than there was because there was like three people skating them, you know. So, uh, so yeah, but it was just so good meeting all these guys. And it's funny because then I'd come back to Harrow and I'd tell everybody, I'd go, guys, you've got to go to skate these contests. And it got to be a problem where, because I, I, was, I, was like, I was a raving fan, you know what I mean? I'd, I'd, been, I'd been to these events. Yeah. I'd met all these amazing people. And I'm just like, I knew that these guys were going to be lifelong friends and they were doing exactly what we had, you know, what we were doing. Um, but I got to a point where all the Harrow boys sent me to Coventry. I'd go to the skate and they wouldn't skate. They're like, Steve, we don't want anything to do with that. We're happy skating here. If right. you want to go do your own thing, you go do it, but we're here. And they, honestly, they, they completely shine me. Right. And I'm just like, all I was trying to do is tell them, going, look, at least go there yeah. and see these guys. I mean, these guys, like I met, remember meeting the Averitt brothers at, at, at Andover and it was hysterical. They came in and they looked the total punks, right? And I'm like, wow, look at these guys with all their boots and their jackets with crass and the dam and all these things on the back of their jackets. And then at night time, because they were staying there, they looked like soul boys. <laughs> they had their hair greased back and they were all like, you know, wearing these Hawaiian shirts and rolled up jeans and stuff like that. And I'm just going, what is that? What's going on there? That's you funny. know, that's and, and it was just, and it? that's the, the environment that I was just like pissing myself you know yeah. just seeing this and living in these huts and skating these uh pools and, and ramps and stuff like that and it was just meeting these people that were just i mean just the most you know lovely people and i was like this is what i love to do you know is this kind of why you started the zine then because you because you started what was it go for it was the zine, yeah wasn't it? i started go for it because you know we were weekend warriors we we, we could only skate saturday sunday right because we were you know primarily i was a ramp skater basically a pool skater and we could yeah. only skate the weekend so monday to friday 
but we had nothing to do. So that would be the time when I would, you know, like regrip my boards and, you know, see all the little dings out of them and use like, you know, blue tack and put grip tape over them and clean my board and re-sew my knee pads. You know, people's knee pads at that time, like five pairs of rectors cut and pasted into one, you know. <laughs> um, and then it was like, well, I can make a zine. And my first zine took me about five minutes. And if you looked at it, you'd go, it probably, I'm surprised it took you five. It was probably one minute. That's brilliant though, isn't it? <laughs> like, because there's such a culture for that back then, wasn't there? People just basically going oh yeah well i'll just do that just bang that together. yeah and it was find it was, a photocopier do and that. i'm like right next one i'm gonna get, make it better yeah and then the next one i'm gonna make it better and the next one i'm gonna make it better and that was the act you know that's as a skateboarder you learn a trick and you want to make it better and better and better and so when i was making the scene i was just like well i want to make it better and better and i got contributors to help out and get me photos in and it, that, that, that that little zine taught me so much about management you know, looking back on it, organization, working with other people. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the skills know, that you probably carried, and, and carried over. And continuously improve. I mean, yeah. it helped, definitely had to sack exactly the same approach with 4 and one as I did with, with, with Go For It. And, and the last one we did was a full, in fact, the second from last one, we called this, uh, it was full glossy uh, cover. Um, oh, and then the whole magazine, my dad was a printer. Um, and he printed it all on glossy paper before I went to America. And then when I came back to America, we did a swindle issue. Right. So it looked like the cover, it was like, oh, it's another glossy one. And the front page was glossy. And then everyone else was just photocopied. But I'd get pictures from like Grant Britton and uh, all sorts of people. So it was, it was, it was pretty cool. So you've, you've, interviews. you've always had this, by the sounds of it, you know, you've been a hustler. You've been, you've been, you've been somebody who's like, well, had an idea and, and basically. It was funny if you, if you've spoken to my, my teachers, I don't think they would have thought that anywhere, yeah, anywhere near, but uh, funny thing about it was, was I thought I never was planning to go to America because, right. and I never told this story really apart from my school friends, but I thought the world was going to end in 1984. So I thought the school <laughs> I a lot was, of people did. I thought the school was going to, I thought the school was, uh, you know, like a joke, right? So I just went to school just to have a laugh with all my friends and I've still got a great bunch of non-skateboard friends that I, I still you know, very, very important to me. Uh, and uh, when I found out in November 83, I'm like, oh shit, I'm wrong on the timing here. I've got to, uh, <laughs> I've got to start school. I actually started working at school and I finished. And I got my, I got my, I went through my exams and actually did them. But uh, up until that point, I had no interest. I had no thought I was going to go to America. You thought the world was going to end. Yeah, I, I thought I got some Nostradamus stuff right. that I was really into and I just got it all, you know. So anyway. It was kind of a thing early 80s though, wasn't it? By then, it's kind of quite an apocalyptic you know, I can't really remember, but in my mind, it was clear it was going to end. So don't right. bother, just go to school and have fun and you're going to skateboard on the weekend. And then, you know, November. So I didn't, up until November, I had no plans. And in, in 84, uh, when we finished school, just I just turned 17. That's when I moved to America. Right. Which is, again, pretty, pretty ahead of its time, really, you know, for, yeah, for a British skateboarder. I just, I felt that even though I loved the Weekend Warriors, I didn't want to be a Weekend Warrior. You I wanted more. I wanted to be... Uh, yeah, I wanted more than that. And, and so did Bod. And I've got to tell you this a funny Bod story. Um, because uh, Bod's heard this story many times. Sorry, Bod. Um, <laughs> but we were, we, we'd go to th th these London contests. There was, um, we'd have fun events. I think it was Dobie's contest. We did one at um, oh, Kennington, I think it was. And I said, I knew all the skateboarders. And then I saw this young little kid. And I'm just like, he's doing bonuses and burts and laybacks. And I'm just like... Well, this guy looks like a good, he's good on a skateboard. And, and give you, at that time, I was already a sponsored skateboarder. I was like European champion now, you know what I mean? Was, there were six guys in the Eurocon <laughs> Open in Sweden, but I won that and got sponsored by Madrid. And I saw this guy and I'm like, hey. So I went up to him, I said, hey, Bod, nice to meet you. I've never met you before. You look good on a skateboard. Have you ever thought about skating vert? I didn't have to ask him if he skated vert because I would have known if he had. Yeah. And he said, uh, thanks for the invite, Steve, but I, um, I'm, I don't really have any interest. So I was like, oh, bummer. Didn't think anything more of it. And then at the next demo, I think was with Billy and Neil Blender. He came up to me and he said, Steve, because I'm skating with those guys. And he said, uh, Steve, is that offer still open? And I said, sure. So the way that I was from Northwest London, I'd have to go past his place at West Hampstead. So we would meet at Finchley Road and then we would either go down to where we are at Brixton right now and then yeah. take the bus to Crystal Palace or we would take the train from Waterloo and go to, and go to Farnborough. And that's what we, would, what we did. And then the first day we went, from then on, we went, every day so if right. you saw bod you saw steve and that's why it was all was that's always that's where it came from and then funny enough again we're in brixton i remember him turning around on the 2b bus and he turned around and he said and pointed at me and he's like steve my ambition's to beat you <laughs> and i pissed myself because i mean it was just <laughs> like the, the distance was so far but by you know the contest was on and every day he improved right and, and you know and it got to a point where um you know forward on all these years we're getting ready to turn pro yeah. right 
I know he was going to beat me at this contest in San Francisco. So I'm like, fuck that. I'm not going to go to that. I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to miss that contest. I have a swerve on that one. Cause I was going for a bit of a tough time with, uh, just being hurt. Uh, and so I went down to far, uh, to Fulbrook. Luckily he did win that contest. Right. He would have beaten me. And then when he turned, <laughs> when he turned pro, we turned pro together and, um, I beat him cause I would drop in and I'd go, can't let that little bugger beat me. And I would drop in and do the light, <laughs> ride of my life. And he would fall over, fall off of everything he possibly could do. And, um, and I'd beat him, right? And then the next contest comes up. He's like, I'm better than you. I go, you haven't beat me yet. And I would beat him again. <laughs> and then I'd beat him again. And then he'd be like, you know, and it's funny, Chris Miller pulled him aside and said, hey, bud. He goes, I used to get last in every contest. He goes, now I'm winning contests. He goes, don't worry, your time will come. Sure enough, he beat me. And I, I shook it. I remember shaking his hand. I go, you know what, bud? I go, congratulations, mate, because you made me a bit, be- a bit, be a better. Yeah, you pushed each other, you know, because I, I wasn't, you know, and it was just, and then when we started New Deal in 1990, he ended up winning the World Championships, which was at Munster, and so he won the the first, he was the first non-American ever to win the World Championships, and then Ed, Ed Templeton had won the street contest for New Deal, so that was just a massive party. Yeah, but, right. But That's... it was incredible watching him grow yeah. and seeing him do tricks that were done so badly. Yeah. Right, and he would keep doing them. Where I would do a trick, and I'd be like. You know, like backside Smith grinds. I just learned backside Smith grinds, did them really badly, couldn't nail them and kept doing them bad. And I go, in the spirit of backside Smith grinds, I've got to stop doing that trick. <laughs> Where Bod had no problem slaughtering many, many tricks. Where like, I'm like, Bod, stop doing that trick. You're killing that, man. It's terrible. That trick was not made for you. Stop doing it, you know? And then wherever, it got, wherever he got through the 10,000 hours, Malcolm Gladwell's Yeah, like, right, there you go. One minute, he just clicked. Yeah. And everything went... Honestly, it's one of the most amazing transformations I've, I've seen of anybody. And I told my son, as a, my son's an aspiring football player, and I, told, I used to tell him, I go, hey, you're, you're, he, he's his bod, uh, the, uh, Bod's his godfather. His godfather. So I call, we call him the Bodfather. <laughs> so I said, hey, Nick, I go, one day, I go, you know, the Bodfather, he was terrible. And then one day it clicked. I go, maybe today it's going to click for you, you know, because just keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it. You know, and people go, oh, Bod must have been a natural. He was absolutely no natural. Such a know. common story that though, isn't it? Like the, especially in skateboarding. I mean, you know, you can't go around that. You've got, you've got, you've keep, got to go through. Keep, keep, you got to go going. through. I mean, that. I'm, I'm gutted. I look back and I go, God, some of those tricks I should have kept doing because I learned tricks the same day as him. And uh, you know, he got to a point where he could do absolutely anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was really, really. It was a super amazing story, and we're still good friends today, and we still work together. And you know, now we're doing this new deal thing. It's back with back with bod yeah you know? that's so, epic that's amazing so it's funny how it all works out but yeah so it's, just, it's a fitting story to tell that story yeah. about bod sitting in brixton, in brixton. When, when he turned around and said i'm gonna beat you and, and then he beat everybody so uh, yeah proud proud moment so what was it like in the states then when you headed over at that time what what, what, what year was your first trip when you went uh, over? 1984 okay what was weird about it was you had to know someone to skate the ramp yeah and you had to abide by their rules of skating that ramp you know what i mean so it wasn't as easy and then getting around with no transportation was really 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 tough yeah i mean it's not like you take, kind of take it for granted now like go to the states you know go to yeah, California no, or whatever was, but... skating ramps was, was was very very tough i was lucky enough to sk- stay with um steve keenan who was a photographer for for santa cruz and he was very close with with lance mountain and lance's ramp was right there so that was really really good those and those those families were fantastic to us and when i moved over there gregor rankin was um from new zealand was over there and he was just an amazing skateboarder and he rode from Madrid too. And so I was very, very lucky to skate with those so you guys. you had a couple of ends that you could Yeah, you and could it's funny, Dan, up. Gregor would tell me about this sto- these stories, these really wild stories about this guy, Lee Ralph. Ralph. And I thought they were, he was exaggerating them. Right. And then I met Lee Ralph and I realized there was no exaggeration. <laughs> this guy wouldn't take a bath for six to eight weeks. Right. You know, yeah. he would tell me these stories. He's like, Steve, you know, very much like the UK, you know, we'd have, you know, not many ramps. And, you know, Lee would have this ramp. And I'd come down in the afternoon and Lee had been skating all morning and realized we only had one set of pads. And so we had to share pads and realized that Lee wouldn't take a shower for six weeks. He goes, <laughs> the guy stank and his pads stank. You imagine putting on wet, smelly pads on and having to skate there. And that's what we did. And I was thinking he was exaggerating. Right. And then I met Lee and I'm like, there was no exaggeration yeah, going on. That, that was happening. But so it was great being out there and being, I think that was a very special time for me. Of, of, I, was tell, I would tell him stories about Bod and all the UK guys, Lucian and, and Danny and everybody and Phil and those guys. And, and um, you know, then he would tell me stories about, you know, guys like Maury and, you know, Dave Crabb and, and uh, ah, so that's you know, where Lee that and stuff came like from. that. So the, the connection of that was really good. And we, we, we were both on similar paths. We knew right. we both had, I lived in the UK, he lived in New Zealand. 
uh, and he wanted to come over and be an Ameri- you know, to, uh, to escape with the Americans. And so I, I came over here for six months, went back for six months, had the most miserable five and a half months of rain in the UK. Yeah. And then I decided after the first night back, my mum said to me, she goes, Steve, what time are you in last night? And when are you going to get a job? And I went, I'm going back to America. And I'm <laughs> not coming back. It's time to leave. Time to so go back. So I went over there. But yeah, it was hard to, um, it was hard to get in there as far as skating. You know, I mean, there wasn't as many ramps as you thought and you had to have an in. You know? Right. So, but the people were phenomenally great to us. The guys like Bryce Knights who helped me out and, Helped me out so much. The guys at Madrid, Bo Brown, who I still work with, he works at, the, at uh, DSM that runs all the, 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 the uh, making all the boards for, for Dwindle and yeah. a bunch of OEM stuff. He, so I'm still working with him. I saw Bryce a little while ago, which is great. And um, yeah, it's been really, really, really great. All these people are super friendly. And how did the Schmidt thing come about then? Well, it's funny. I remember uh, Madrid at the end of it making me a board. Um, and I had a template and I remember walking through a trade show and then Paul's like, oh, is this the board you want me to make you? Right. I'm like, no, but yes. <laughs> right. Know? Well, it's funny. It's a quick story about Madrid. So we, we ended up Madrid, Madrid. I used to work at Madrid. These guys were really cool. And uh, Madrid, we, um, John Lucero quit the team and he had the best-selling graphic, he had the Joker graphic. And they decided to make that board be an ex-team rider. So they took John Lucero's name off and put ex-team rider. Right. So we just went, fuck this. This is bullshit. So we all, we all quit. So we we went we really? in there. We wrote ex team rider and signed the board and, and left. Wow, that's a mad story. So uh, so anyway, it was perfect time to to leave. So yeah, when we got onto Schmidt and um, uh, that was really a big thing at the time. And I once I left Madrid, I wanted a little bit of time to get on Schmidt. And then I finally um, I went down to Vision. It was me, Bod, and uh, I think Jeff Grosso. I think it was, and, and maybe Spidey drove. And I went down there, and again, it was a big thing that you know. And I met this guy Steve Rocco. And he gave me a box that was basically a set of wheels and a t-shirt. And for us at that time, we lived off of product. That's, that's how we, that's yeah, how right, we sure. lived. And um, Bod said to me, as we're walking back, you know, long walk, he's like, you don't care about that, do you? You don't care about that package. And I just threw the package over this fence. <laughs> I'm just like, it was meant to be a big deal. I wrote for Schmidt 6. I get one t-shirt and a, uh, you know. Right. You know, it was just like, so my first, my first moments with Rocco was not good. In fact, the funny enough, the next one was I was at, uh, 1986 the expo contest in vancouver and i pulled up at the contest and i can't remember who got me there but i think team england i think they helped us out and rocco said to me they bought you <laughs> wow <laughs> and i'm like okay cool you're meant to be my team captain you know because he was team captain of, of sims right and, and vision you know what i mean That's some motivation but we ended up becoming you. really quite i'd like to say quite close friends at the end but they, yeah. my first three incidences with him were all really that's a negative and still tough love isn't it yeah it was, i was like <laughs> wow okay but, yeah, um, good luck anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, but that, that contest was a fun one. That was, I mean, there was, you know, that was our first time of actually skating in like a big event. I remember, I remember dropping into this ramp and looking over one side and seeing like, you know, like maybe ten thousand people. Wow. And no one on the right hand side. The World's Fair was going on right there, and I remember dropping in and just going, "No one out there is going to worry about the way I skate because right. I'm, I'm the lip trick guy, right? Yeah, yeah. And people want to see blasting big air, so I'm just like, I'm just going to, ch- I'm just going to have fun. I'm just going to skate the way I did, you know. And I got third, which was which 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 was which was huge huge for me. That's yeah, right. Started my kind of my, my career kind of kicking off because the Americans were going. Oh, I think we're going to take the top ten, all the top ten, and yeah. know, to get in third was a, was a, was a big thing there. Yeah. So is this about the time that you started doing the column for Rad as well? Because yeah, I guess we're talking like late eighties era. Yeah, right? and that's well, that was eighty six. So then after that, then my next big contest was uh, the the Liptrick contest. But yeah, around that time, I was doing the Rad column, and what was fun about that is. I had a really good relationship with Tim. Yeah. And he knew that he could depend on me and he knew that I was, you know, I was like a total skate rat, right? After we finished skating, me and Bod would just be talking about skateboarding. That's all we did. We'd watch videos, talk about skateboarding. And yeah. We, life was solely around that. Whereas other guys like Jeff Kendall, a really good friend of mine, Jeff Kendall, when he finished skating, he wouldn't talk about skateboarding. He was right. in a band. He was, you know, doing all this other stuff. And we were like, that's a part-timer. We've got it. You've got to be, you know. you got to be all in. you got to in. be all in, 100% in. So I, I was like my ear to the ground and I wanted to, I knew I wanted to be involved in this thing. So we decided, I can't remember how we decided, but I would do my little column and, you know, end up being my own page. Yeah. And um, so the funny thing about that was, was when people were getting that news, that was by far the newest news. So, so Oh man, I mean, I remember it. It was like list of tricks, wasn't it? You know, a lot of it, sometimes it was Team just, changes, exactly, contest results. Sometimes it'd just be like, you know, Sean Sheffy, like in like my era, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and you'd be like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. you know, you'd, and, that was how you kept up to date, basically. Because in the meantime, you had to wait for the videos, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, in the old days, it was easier. Thrash the trans wasn't a video. Yeah, but basically, in, in, in the interim, 
that's what you had like those things didn't you so that that's when it started so so right? tim so tim would give me you know he know he he knew that he would uh, depend on me and i would you know get all the news and then i'd fax it in and then he would do that would be the last page in the magazine so yeah this news was coming in on one day maybe the next day it was going to the printer and the week after people were reading stuff that only happened eight days before. yeah yeah no i remember it was it, so was, it was before thrasher and transor because they had longer lead times yeah you know? exactly again it was pretty ahead of its time really especially for a little uk mag because it was yeah. you know it's just a little little window on the scene at the time was like pretty unattainable wasn't it yeah. so yeah, it's that it hustle again so you basically finding yeah. finding the foothold to, yeah, well, it, is this the industry like when you start to basically get more into the industry side of things then? yeah and then after after the the, the lip trick contest uh, my career really kicked in uh, and then i got hurt then i had knee surgery and right. it, it changed my whole life because i realized up until that point i'm like this thing's gonna end one day Right. right. How, how old were you then at this uh, point? Let me think. I was probably twenty. I'm so young though, and it's. Still... <laughs> I just thought. I just thought. I go. You know. What, you know. Because I, I never thought about that this thing was going to ever going to end. Right. And but when I had well, knee surgery, because you were twenty, because like, you were like I'm six six months out of no skateboarding. Right. Um. And it was just. I was like. I've got to. I've got to be thinking about something else. And I don't know what that was going to be. But I'm yeah. just like one day this plan, will end. A plan B. And then getting over the knee surgery. You know, as I got my pro board and everything else like that, it was just. Um. You know, I came back stronger. Um, and then you know at the end we were in a situation where I, I would actually start working with the trade shows like Paul Schmidt would invite me down I would actually do the zine the, the Schmidt Sticks team zine right what I did at go for it he was yeah. like hey, why don't you make a team zine so I started making the team zine um, and then the situation between Paul and Dorfman was terrible it had broken down the communication had broken down with them and I would go to the trade show and I would, you know, I'd go to the, the, the vision distribution because vision distribution, I don't know if you know it, but vision distribution started off as a, as a distributor and it would distribute PAL and all these different brands, right? And then um, Paul Schmidt came over and actually ran their wood shop and he got them to make a lot of boards. And then as skateboarding took off, PAL and Santa Cruz couldn't pick up with, with demand, but sat, but uh, vision could make it. So this vision started making vision skateboards, I even though it was vision that. distribution. I didn't, I didn't know that. That's where it came from. So then that right. so vision skateboards was this massive thing with Gator and everybody on the team. Then right. they did vision streetwear, right? Well, then and when it vision, all came from that. Yeah, well, then vision streetwear died. Yeah. No one wanted to go to vision distribution to get their Santa Cruz boards or their power boards. So their whole thing died. Right. But before that, all that thing died they would really focus on you go to the trade show booth it would be basically vision right so i did i, I had a, my schmidt stick shirt was out so i put my schmidt stick shirt front and center i walked back from the trade show booth and someone immediately came up and took it and put it in the back <laughs> and put the vision shirt in front of it so i just knew i could i could see you know it's clear to see that their focus was vision and then oh if you want to buy schmidt sticks and, and uh because uh, it was their home brand yeah and, and, and then uh sims so i was just like we got to get out of it um, but not thinking how we could do it. Right. And then Bob DeNike walked up to me and he's like, Steve, whenever you guys are ready, we're ready to back you. And I'm just like, I, my mouth, I'm just like, really? So why do you think he said that? Do you, what, do you, well, he knew that, uh, I think, think he was making boards at the time. What, like Paul, what's he seeing there? Paul had a secret where, a, a wood shop at the time that only a couple of us knew about. Right. Um, I knew about it because I was making the zine and I knew it was, you know, it's like kind of, he, he was running the wood shop. Paul had, was running the Visions wood shop but then had his own little wood shop for his own making, uh, making, for making his, boards and for stuff his like that. It was, it was real, real, real secret. Yeah. Um, so then, so then, you know, Bob did actually know something was more, and I didn't know that at the right. time, you know? So then I went up to Paul and I said, Paul, you know, NHS will back us. And he's like, oh, I've known that for ages. So will Rocco. And right then I'm just like, my, my mind then was like, we are leaving this place and we're going to do our own thing. There was no doubt in my mind. Right, so, you, so this was 1989. So you, so you had the straight away you had the vision you were like right we can we, we got can. it now 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 people will back us we, yeah. we can do our own thing we need to do our own thing so that was the genesis that was yeah the start so this of it. was i think this was the beginning of 1989 so then in 1989 i went back to the summer um and i met these guys at harris skate park called ray and gary and they knew i had a bunch of product um because that's how we that was how we we worked in the old days i'd get some uh, shorts from quicksilver and trade them for some stickers some santa cruz stickers and we would all trade and yep. i came back with a load of product with no money but a load of product and i met these guys at the skate park and they said hey steve i hear you've got a load of product we, we want to buy it all i go you have no idea how much i have <laughs> right um thought about shop lad. so they came <laughs> so they came over to my sister's house and they bought and they're like oh yeah we didn't realize you have this much stuff no we can't buy this all but we'll buy this every we'll buy some every week and they right. come over and buy every week and, and their shop was called new deal skates so i'm like mm, it's a great name I like right. that name um, and then this, and then I was working on the rad photo annual and this is a classic story. 
So I'm working on the red photo annual. Paul calls me up and says, Steve, I know you're working on the photo annual. You've got good ties in with, uh, with, with Tim and everybody over there. Hey, look, I'll pay for an ad. Don't worry, hitting the distributor up for the ad, but just make the ad happen and I'll pay for it. Right. And I'm like, cool, that's great. I go, I've already got one board. I know what I want to shoot. I just got to get the other board. So I thought, okay, who's the distributor? And I'm going, oh, Surrey Skateboards. They're the distributor of, of Schmetzlicks. <laughs> cool, well, that's where I used to buy my skateboards. Yeah. So I, I thought, it'd be kind of nostalgic. Get on the train. You know, go down there, go to, uh, you know, go to uh, Waterloo, take the train down to Woking, walk down the street and go into Surrey Skateboards. I mean, that was just like a really, you know, just a great thing I used to do as a, as a young kid. So I did that, super stoked, walked in there and I walked up to him. I said, hey, I'm, I'm Steve Douglas. Um, I was Steve Reed when I was over here. Um, used to buy my boards here. Love coming back here. Now I'm a, I'm a professional in America. I write for one of the companies that you distribute. I work for Rad Magazine. You probably maybe see my page. Um, Paul very nicely is honored to uh, give him, uh, he's going to buy an ad, a Schmidt sticks ad. He just told me to make it. I've got one on my boards. Just need to get the other one. And the response was not what I was expecting, but it, <laughs> but it helped change my life and maybe other people's. He's like, Oh, last time I did this for Danny Webster, I never got the board back. And I go, I go, hang on a second. That's go. funny. I go, I go, hang on a second. I go, I am making an ad that you're not going to pay for, but you're the distributor. I just need to get one board. He goes, no, but you're not listening to me, Steve. The last time I gave a board to Danny Webster, I never got the board back. And I said, I, I, go, I pull out my wallet. I go, you fucking telling me <laughs> that I'm going to pour my money out of my wallet to buy my board with my name on it, <laughs> that we're going to put an ad in that you're not going to pay for it, but yet that ad is hopefully going to sell boards? Oh, just calm down, Steve. Calm down. Yeah, 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 no, no problem. And I was just like, right then I just went, this has got to change. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Like I'm having to sell stickers as yeah. traveling around. Not that I was a big name pro or anything, yeah. but you know, I, I'm, I'm and other people are not being taken care of from the distributors. And a lot of these distributors are selling concrete and BMX and widgets. And it's like, oh, skateboards are hot this year, right? And I'm like, I want to I wanna start something new that's going to change all that. And um, so then, you know, you can see how this is coming together. Yeah, yeah. So then this is, I go back to, back to America in 1990 and... Um, me and Andy had already been talking. Me and Andy Howard had been already talking. And we knew that Chris Miller was looking at leaving. Quit well on Andy then. So how'd you meet Andy? Oh, there's a funny story on that. I met Andy in Virginia Beach and I thought he was a ripping vert skater. Yeah. And then I saw him a couple of years later. I went back to Virginia Beach and I went to him. I said, hey, where's Andy? I love that guy's skating. Well, I mean, I remember, I think I met him in uh, Cambodia ramping down in Florida, I think it was. Um, and he was from Virginia Beach. So I went back there the next summer and I said to the guys, I go, where's Andy? Oh, he doesn't skate vert that much. I go, really? What a shame. He was one of the best. He goes, yeah, he's probably only here like five times a week. The rest of the time, he's just skate, street skating. <laughs> I'm like, what? He hardly skates. You only skate, you know, only five times. He goes, I go, you skate seven days a week. He looked at me and he said, yeah, we all skate seven days a week. And right then I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, me and Bod knew that. We were like, oh my God. You know, when we were back on the West Coast, we we're like, we're not skating seven days a week, which I couldn't. I could skate six days a week. Bod yeah. could skate seven days a week. That's why he beat me. No, but um, uh, <laughs> right. But yeah. So that's how you met him, and then you're having the. So you brought him in, basically. Andy. Yeah. So you know, because Andy yeah. was a team up rider on Schmidt's thing, yeah. right? And um, so I had. We knew that Miller was leaving, and I just and I was actually wearing a New Deal skate shirt, right? Right. Um, at 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 this contest, and I, so Andy, I knew Andy was trying to leave. We were talking. I was talking to SMA. He was talking to SMA, and then Chris Miller had left. So I just said to I said to Andy, I go, look, hey, Paul's in Ispo right now. When he comes back, I'm going to hijack him. I'm going to tell him, hey, we're going to start a company called New Deal. Right. Or, or we're done. So he came back at this, at this NSA contest and I just finished. It was a three ride contest. So, you know, one of those ones where you first ride, you just get a ride under your belt. Second ride, you kind of go for it. That, I made that one too. Third one, I went like, you know, like a stream for me. Yeah. And I made them all. And Paul came out. He's like, oh, you know, he's like, hey, Steve, great, great. Those are some great rides there. And I said, hey, Paul, we got to talk. So we drove over to, just me and, me and Paul, I went over to, I, I think I was maybe meant to have waited for Andy, but I was just like, I'm gonna, this is my opportunity. And yeah, I yeah. sat down with him, I said, hey Paul, look, you know, Miller's left, you know that. Um, I've been speaking to Andy, speaking to the team, we wanna do this company called The New Deal. And if you don't, we're basically all gone. Right. And so he was like, okay, let, let, you know, let, me, let me think about it, let me, let me look into it. And then we were back at the hotel room and Andy had actually done the first sketch right and then really paul, what paul, the logo yeah paul came through the door was, right. i remember there's a load of us in the in, in the room paul came in the door and he said he said something like if we're not on rock and roll band and we don't make coffee it's okay <laughs> right because the, the lawyer had said you know, you can be new deal if you're not those two things right and it was kind of like 
That's the logo. That saying's our first ad. And that was our first ad. Yeah. So we sat in that room and it was really going to be real, right? And so the crazy story was we sat down and we said, look, everybody's got to keep this quiet. It's got to be quiet because we, we don't want to let Vision know what we're doing. We need the board sales, but keep it quiet. I shit you not, I walked out the door <laughs> and next door was John Lucero. And John Lucero's going, why are you guys so happy? Why are you make guys go happy? He goes, you've just lost Chris Miller, right? He goes, you guys are going to leave Vision. And you're going to call it, you're going to start your company, The New Deal. Because I had New Deal sticker on my board. And right. I had New Deal shirt, right? So he clocked you. And I'm just sat there and I went, we're well, meant to keep this secret. It's been, honestly, I'm <laughs> not exaggerating. The shortest secret this has been like five, It's been like five minutes max, right? That is hilarious. And my response back to him was, I go, trying to look calm. I go, Paul, I go, you know, Paul, we love Paul, but he's the biggest pussy in the world. There's no way he would leave Vision. There's no way he would. Um, and he said, oh, okay. And I walked off and I walked away going, oh my goodness, what did we do? So, uh, and then at that point, we just basically camp camped out at Paul's house. Right. Andy and uh, Gorn Boberg focused on the art and I focused on making the video stuff. And the yep. video stuff that we made, I mean, it wasn't, there was no, in that first 15 minute promo video, there was no New Deal footage in that. You know, the only New Deal footage for me was New Deal Skates t-shirt that I'm wearing in it. But everything else is all Schmitzlick's footage. And some of that footage is from 1986. And for my rights, it was just, you know, this was just footage that was just sitting around the kind of collecting dust that was, you know, there was never going to be like a Schmidt video. I yeah, don't know why sure. there wasn't, but so it was just like, kind of, we're going to make this video. And um, it, we just, it was a really great feeling of being able to do what you want. I remember speaking to Paul and I go, Paul, I want to go to, to Scream and Squeegees and I want to make, make this t-shirt. Because Bod had, they used to have this GNS shirt that had four logos in a row. And I'm like, I want to do the version of that with the New Deal. So I went down to Chicken's Place, who's Screaming Squeegees, and cut the rubies and made this shirt, this four in a row shirt. You know, right. it's just like the freedom. Yeah, well, do that. That, that's what I was going to ask you because, you know, you just like really casually said like, yeah, Andy and, and Gorm did the artwork and then I did the videos. But then earlier you mentioned like, how the fuck did I make those videos? I didn't have a clue what I was well, doing. I mean, I so, couldn't... But like, it sounds like all of you... You'd never done it before, right? You're all, you're all young lads, basically. Yeah. What, how old are you all? Like 18, 19, 20? Oh, yeah, you know? 22 at that time. You know yeah. what I mean? So you're all young lads and you're all just basically like, yeah, we're going to start a brand and we're going to, you do the art, I'll do the videos. And presumably you're working it out. You just kind of- Yeah, and Paul was doing the production. It seemed, it seemed totally natural. Yeah, you know which I mean? is brilliant though, isn't it? Yeah. Because it was, I think that's probably what gave it its freshness, right? And it's it's kind of aesthetic and yeah. what, what appealed to people, yeah. basically. Well, it's funny you say that. There's another sort of funny story on that. When I, when, I made, when I finished making the promo video, I lived in Northern California and I was actually commuting back back and forth with a guy, Bob Schmelzer. And Bob Schmelzer lived in Northern California but had a girlfriend. No, had a, he lived in Southern California at the time, had a girlfriend in Northern California. So right. I would just hit tries with him back and forth. And I'm getting ready to make this video. And we had this, the idea was we'd, we'd, we'd done this first catalog, which we've actually just mailed out around the world just recently again. And we did this first catalog, New Deal catalog, when it didn't have a PO box, didn't have anything on it. Right. And it was just like, why is this company with New Deal? It had our names in it and, and us, us skating, but it didn't say how to get hold of it. It didn't say Paul was involved. So we're trying to create this mystery, which, which worked. And then, um, then we made, you know, then I was working on the video. Um, and again, the product hadn't come out, but we, we were making samples and all of this stuff. So the video's getting ready to finish, and when the video's getting finished, that's when the brand's getting ready to be launched. And so I'm, uh, we were gonna use Agent Orange music, right? It was like, okay, that's one less thing to worry about. And then I finished the video, and Paul calls me up, and he goes, Steve, you've got some bad news. We can't use Agent Orange music, because if we use Agent Orange music, it's gonna ruin their record deal. It's, a, it's their new album. Yeah, like licensing so issues. I'm like, damn, you know. So it seemed like it was like that morning, and that afternoon I was driving up to Northern California. I drove up to Northern California. I had a friend called Ray Stevens. I knew he had some music contacts. And so I said, hey, um, um, you know, this is what happened. And he gave me the tape of the odd numbers. Right. And I listened to that and I went, wow, that sounds, it's going to work out perfect. Yeah. Drove back down south, uh, let Andy check it out. And we were like, that's it, it was done. And that's, the rest is history. So the new, you know, the new Deal video was all soundtrack was from the odd numbers. And so it was very, 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 very lucky. But I was speaking with one of my old guys that I used to work with on, on video and form one, Kirk Deander. And I told him that story. And he's like, Steve, I wonder if New Deal had been a, as big a success with using Agent Orange that it would have already been old. You know, here you were starting a company called The New Deal and it yeah. was a new, you know, because a lot of you guys hadn't been seen before. The art hadn't been seen before and the sound hadn't been seen before. Yeah. You know, so we'll never know, thank goodness, well, what like it would be like with Agent Orange. Massive part of the video is like totally, like those soundtracks. Because, you know, for, for young kids in England, for example, yeah, you never heard of those bands. Yeah. You know, you, know you, you don't know who the skaters are, you don't know who the bands are. It's, it's completely like mind blowing thing, basically. So, so, so I, sorry, I've got to tell you because my memories are just coming all back. But I, 
I go into Harrow and we started off because when we started New Deal, we started New Deal UK in the in, 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 and so let me just go on that for a second. So when we started New Deal, I wanted it to be a New Deal for for the distributors around the world. I yeah. traveled around the world. I'd seen the state of distribution. Which is another element I didn't really realize. So I was like, you know what? Let's, let's not give New Deal to people that had already been established distributors that could sell widgets and everything else. Let's give it to skateboarders. Hopefully right. that they will learn distribution and they will be end up being, you know, they'll learn business and they'll take care of skateboarding. So we gave a lot of these guys their first brand, said, look, here's New Deal. Go figure it out. Go right. figure it out. And a lot of these guys are still in business today. Right. Um, but we said, you've got to take, you, you know, you, you'll have team riders. They can get product from you and we will replenish. And you've got to take care of the riders when you come through. And that was like, you know, that's a standard today. But that sure. certainly wasn't a standard then. Yeah, yeah. And so we took a risk with New Deal. But we were, it, it was lucky for us because we were this starting from nothing. Where some of these big companies were going from doing forty million dollars a year down to four million dollars, yeah. and we were just starting starting up as a brand, so it was very you know we we could take more risks. And plus, we really didn't know what we were really doing. You know what I mean? We were just like, well, this is going to be fun. Let's just do this, and it and it worked out. You know, um, but it was a fun time for us to do to, to change distribution. But that's something that I'm most proud of today, right. knowing that distribution around the world has not only did we at that time of year. Of, of sorry of skateboarding skateboarder run businesses were done but also skateboarding run distributors yeah around yeah the world, you know which is like proper you know unsung part of the industry really yeah obviously so so integral part of the industry yeah you know so anyway so yes yeah, so that's uh a bit of a bit a bit of new deal well the skateboarders i've got a question about that obviously because mm. the the team's obviously legendary and you know a templin obviously um you know you had you had some absolutely amazing skateboarders on there so where, where did you how did you how did that all come about how did it evolve well we were very lucky because we a lot of the guys were getting flow from schmidt so we basically took the best guys from schmidt sticks at the time and you know they weren't really no none of none of us had video parts out, yeah right so we were very very lucky in that so it was really kind of schmidt with a couple of changes you know like yeah bryce was uh getting ready to retire so there's no way you know i'm like hey we're not going to bring bryce over he's getting ready to retire on schmidt sticks so we're not going to bring him a retiree onto new deal even though his board sold i'm like we're not going to do that. And, you know, he was retiring anyway. So we were we were able to, um, you know, take a lot of the guys that had been on Schmidt Sticks. And then a lot of the guys, you know, would said to everybody, hey, look, if, you, if we're on the hunt for, for new guys. Right. So a lot of the guys came in as, as new. I can't really remember. I think Rick Ibercetta was was new. John Montesi was new. Um, you know, in fact, yeah, in one of their New Deal stories, they said, you know, like, hey, I was expecting to get a Schmidt box and it ended up being a New Deal box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which was, which, which was kind of fun. So, and then after the company came out, I mean, we were trying to get other people on the team. I mean, I tried to get Jeff Kendall on the team. I tried to get Bod be a part of the company. I tried to get Wade Spire. I tried to get Tom Boyle, God rest his soul. You know, I tried to get a lot of guys. And, and luckily, that all that stuff didn't happen. You know, Andy yeah. was trying to get different people and for whatever reason, it didn't happen. It ended up working well in the end, you know, for sure. I mean, Andy's a massive part of it, right? Oh, we couldn't have done it without Massive Andy. part of the aesthetic. We couldn't. I mean, he gave it. But also Gorm Boberg. Andy, no doubt. I mean, Didn't Gorm, realize that about Gorm. Yeah, Gorm, Gorm is, is an unsung hero of this whole thing. And right. he's definitely not going to be that this time around. Um, and he's been doing art for Polar. Because I knew him as years. a team. You know, I knew, I knew he skated. Knew him yeah. from the films. Yeah. But didn't realize he had this kind of background. Well, it's funny. People think that Andy did so much of the graphics. Well, Andy did a lot of the graphics. But in the first drop, actually, Gorm's got more for, more graphics than Andy. Yeah, I didn't know that. You know, that's I mean, amazing. Chris Miller, Chris Miller did uh, Moy's graphics. Yeah, uh, but uh, Gorm, so had, the Gorm had to clean it up. Did he? He did the sun, did he? Uh, Andy did the sun. Right. Yeah, Andy did the sun, okay. and that came in. It's funny. I remember coming back because the original, the original drawing that he did, it didn't have the sun in it. Right. So I remember coming back from a trip, and I was like, I remember walking walking through twelve eighty one, which was the, the name of Logan Street where 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 we were. Twelve eighty one, yeah, which ended up being one of our videos. And as I walked past, I'm like, what's that little thing in between the skateboard products? And then he was like, oh, that's the sun. We're going to use that because in sometimes we're not going to be able to have to even use the New Deal logo. We just have the sun. I'm like, cool. And that was it. So that was all Andy. Right. You know, but Andy used to, Andy and Gorm's style was very, very, very similar. Yeah. Um, so that's why I think Andy gets, you know, the credit he deserves. Yeah. But then Gorm doesn't get it. And it's not that Andy didn't say that. It's just, that's just the way that life is. But Gorm definitely, we've got to give a lot of respect to Gorm. He did the Siamese graphic. He did the spray can graphic. Right. No way. Yeah. Really? And, and, and that original seven boards, like, you know, those are two of them. And then he redrew. Right, right. You know, he cleaned up the, uh, the Morris graphic. Oh, that's you know? great. So it must be really nice that you can, again, kind of give, give him the credit, for example. Yeah, because it, it you know, I, I've been on the both sides of end ups of things where, uh, side where you get credit. It's better to get, it's like getting a contest run. It's better, you know, like, like getting fourth and go, oh, you got ripped off, man. You should have got third or second. Yeah. Then, 
you got first, but you shouldn't have got first. You should have got third. You know what I mean? Like no one wants to hear that shit. You know no. what I mean? And I've been like, you know, I remember being at this uh, at this Castle Awards, and you know, we, we I think we were promoing Eustace Wooden Toys, and Sonia Catalano got up and did this presentation in front of all the castle and saying, "Hey, Paul Schmidt, he's um he's been here, he's working every night, finishing off this video, and this video's finished and stuff like that." I'm sitting there going, "It was me." <laughs> but you know you're not going around tell you I'm not going to tell you hey that was me yeah yeah and, and well, feeling you're, really, well you're British as well and feeling so. really bad right going, going oh man you know I just put a lot of effort into that but then on the other side of it then suddenly I was doing something I can't remember what it was but I was getting all the credit oh Steve Douglas has done all this and I'm like I didn't do anything of that. Yeah. You know, and I felt really, that was a really nasty feeling. For That's me. probably how Owen feels about this podcast, to be honest. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just think I, I, I'm, I'm always want to be, give credit where credit's due. You know what I mean? And don't, you know, and that's that's what I'm all about. It's you got to give credit where credit's due. So, yeah. You know, Andy, without doubt, we couldn't have done it without Andy, but we couldn't have done it without Paul either. You know what I mean? Yeah. We couldn't yeah. Do it without the team, and we couldn't. You know, the odd numbers were a huge part of that too. Yeah. And, and, and just a quick on the odd numbers story because I, I remember telling this story because this is a it's a great learning experience for me. So we started New Deal. Ed had um, we were getting ready to go to Munster. We come back New Deal UK, and I'm thought I'm going to make a phone call. I'm going to be America. You know, I'm from America now. I'm, I mean, I'm English. Pr- very proud of it. But um, I'm going to I'm going to call up the shop. Yeah. So I remember calling up a shop in Sheffield, I think called Boatworld. I called up Boatworld, and this, this is the conversation. I go, hey, Steve Douglas from New Deal. Suddenly, not interested. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I go, hang on a second, hang on a second. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I go, uh, I go you sell skateboards? He goes, yeah, I sell loads of them. I go, you sell World Industries? He goes, yeah, it's bestseller. I go, well, not being funny, but we just started New Deal, but New Deal is right behind World in America. He goes, well, I don't want any. I go, let me send you a video. I don't want one. <laughs> and at this point, at this point, I'm ready just to say, F you. I'm never going to sell to you anyway because I don't like your attitude, right? Yeah. But I just kept it calm. And I'm like, hey, look, let me just do me a favor. Let me just send you the video and, and, and we'll talk when we get back from Munster, right? I, I remember, it, and I kept it cool and I put the phone down and I went, and I went, I screamed. <laughs> and then I, I remember jumping on my board and skating around Harrow and then just going, oh, that was my first phone call that I'd made in my new company in yeah. England, you know, for as far as the distribution part sure, of the business, yeah. right? Anyway, so I was super frustrated and being like, oh. Anyway, Ed won the, Ed, we went to the contest. Ed won it. Yeah. Ed won the vert contest. Classic. I came back, called the guy up. And I'm like, hey, it's Steve. Oh, hey, Steve. <laughs> that video's great. He goes, I can, that's the only video I can play that I can, the soundtrack, it doesn't piss off all the mums. He goes, to be honest with you, I would love to have that on CD because I would love to listen to that on the way into work. Right. That's and it hilarious. taught me so much because I'm just like, I've been in so many situations like that before where I'm ready to go. Yeah, yeah. You know, my, my inside of my body goes, no, I'm not having that. And I just go, <laughs> hang on a second, boat well, new deal story, odd numbers. That's you know? brilliant. You know, so it's, just, it's kind of an inspiring story of just being like, hey, like sometimes yeah. you've just got a call, even though you want to react, don't react. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, I mean, Andy, Andy Howe today, he could have reacted there's one part in Andy Howe's podcast today where he's just like I want to keep this positive he could have gone in a different area yeah. you know but he didn't and he kept that and I'm proud that he did that because you don't it's not focus on the negative it's focus on the yeah, focus on the positive well, it's, it's, a, posi- positive it's, it's stuff, a positive you know? story isn't it ultimately yeah. especially especially at this point you know <laughs> yeah, that's what it is <laughs> surviving all this yeah yeah no it's brilliant yeah. so I got a quick one on Underworld Element yeah because I bought his first board yeah and that was you guys as well right so how did that come about well what was happening was we had got a big team. We got a lot of pros and we had, I think at the if I remember, we had eight AMs that could turn pro. And it was like, right, well, we are... And at the same time, Andy was... I could feel that he just wasn't that connection. Right. Uh, for other reasons. I mean, we hadn't been... We were three years into this thing. We hadn't been paid. We had promises and all that sort of stuff. See, he was kind of drifting off. And Rick Ibersetter had said something to me, like, me and Andy want to do our own thing. We want to call it Element. Something, it was something words like that. Right. And I'm, at the time, I'm like going, oh, I could, I, 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 it makes sense. I could see why. Because I could just tense that Andy was not just not, not there. And then we also had a time when we're like, well, you know, around that time, we had eight guys that were going to turn pro. And I'm like, if we don't turn these, guys, turn these guys pro, then they're going to turn pro for somebody else. Yeah. And we didn't want to have a team like H Street, as I you know, remember having like, you know, 30, 30 yeah, riders 50 on there, guys. Right? Yeah. So I was just like, so I sat down with Paul. I remember going into and talking to Paul and go, Paul, look, I think you both sense that Andy's not that focused on on new deal at the moment right for whatever reason you know 
maybe it's time to start something new. We've got right. a bunch of guys that are getting ready to turn pro. Andy's got his crew of people. Ali is really, you know, Chris Hall is, is part of Andy's crew. Um, and I just go, you know, for where we're going and what we can do in the future. I, I don't want to have the pressure. It's only a new deal. We should start our version of an, another brand. It's pretty forward thinking again, though, that because again, you could have been a dick about that, really, or or it could have it could have become weird. But well, we just we just wanted people to do their own thing. It's yeah, like, you know, it's you like, followed that through though by doing that. If didn't anyone you? ever said, came up to me, employees have said to me, "Go, I've got this great opportunity." I mean, I had this one, one situation. We're trying to get hold of this guy, and we wanted a, a bilingual speaker for dealing with South America, and this guy. We got this guy and we take him, we take him from another brand um, and we got him. And after six months, he came up to me. He's like, Steve, I've got the opportunity to do mortgage with some mortgage banking with my friend. And I, I really want to do this. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to lose you. But you know what? I don't want to hold you back. Yeah. Because, if, you know, if it goes really well, I, I, I mean, I don't want to deal with that guilt. <laughs> he retired about a year and a half later. <laughs> you know, he's like 24 or something like that. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, you know, if someone comes to me, I'm like, I'm never going to try and talk them out of it right or, or at least blow smoke and say no in the future bro, i'm going to take care of you and yeah like yeah that. no no way no way i'm not going to do that if we have a guy that's really good i'm going to give him a part of the company yeah so then he doesn't want to move on yeah, you know yeah. I mean? and then we did that we did that and paul helped us with that and that when paul gave me and andy a part of it we reciprocated like that when we did four on one we gave people parts of the company you know what i mean the people that deserved it yeah you know but yeah so underworld started off and um it was actually pretty much uh, the, the release wasn't very good we had a really terrible dark booth and the product that we'd come out with was was sublimated wood on wood it was you know sublimated plastic boards were, were big at the time with slicks but no one had ever yeah done i mean I, it was the, the height of the slick era wasn't it we never we never did we never did it on wood and yeah. the first range of these boards were very very dark sublimated wood boards and we had a trade show booth that was super dark right and it was probably the worst launch in my opinion of a brand that we'd been involved with <laughs> right i mean it was really was it was it was pretty shocking it was just like oh my goodness you know let's not let's not let's not do this again yeah and um but you know it was a fantastic company they did and he was very forward thinking i mean like, all of his stuff he had this super great like huge pk tops and um you know he, he we'd done the new deal big jeans and we'd done, yeah. we were the first one to do tops you know he, for new he, had, deal. he had a proper thing going on didn't he you know yeah, he, had, he had a clear vision you know you oh. can you, you could really i mean you could see it at the time you know you could see that basically his what he was into was varied and it really showed through didn't it and oh huge huge he i mean he had all these tops and these like Dick, you know, he was the first one to make like Dickie's pants. Yeah. Because you know, that's what the skateboarders were wearing, Dickie's pants. But he was like, oh, well, no one's making these style. They were making jeans. Yeah. So it's like for Element, it's going to be Dickie's and we're going to have polos and they're going to be, you know, like like polo shirts. And we used like Curtis McCann doing the shifty and yeah. that was our polo guy, right? But then he didn't want to make them super clean. So he made the edges frayed on the ed, you know, on, on, on the sleeves and stuff like that. So it's a very great look that he had. So he, he made a great uh, aesthetic about it, an underworld element. And then, you know, how that all, all that, all that, yeah, yeah it I came together the, the, and it's completely different than getting Julian on the team yeah and I mean like that. It's amazing well yeah. we, we need to talk about your accident I think because we've kind of skipped that haven't we your, which is like about so this is like yeah right so when it was around is, about that time it was right, right when this that. is all going on yeah, right yeah yeah good, me good memory so yeah it was funny enough it was April 12th 1991 I had been uh, you know now I had my own car right um, and so I was driving down, I'd skate all day and then I would drive at night going way too fast. You know, it's a seven, eight hour drive and I would yeah. do it like five hours, five and a half hours. Yeah, it's a big, you know, back and forth. And I didn't have a CD player at the time or didn't have any music. My wife was like, Steve, you fall asleep every time you get into a car. You've got to get it. It kills me when you guys, you guys are driving at night. So I drove, um, I put a CD player in. Her mum had given me some of Evian spray boards. She goes, oh, if you get tired, just spray your face. <laughs> Go on, mum. And um, <laughs> so I went, I, you know what I'd do? I'd usually get hurt and then I would drive down to Southern California and stay there till I got better and then I would come back up and skate, right? Right. And I would just work, work, work. So I'd get, I'd get down there. I'd work, you know, seriously 16, 18 hours a day every day and not go to the beach or anything like that. I'm just like, I'm going down on a mission yeah. and I'm going to work. So I came back going on the Friday. I remember driving up and uh, it was afternoon and it was hot. And I remember pulling over. I was tired. I remember getting some getting some food and um and i'm just going god man i wish bob was here if bob was with me right now he could be driving and i'd be in the sleep on back in the back yeah and then the thing, next thing i know i woke up and i'm going i'm not going 80 miles an hour i'm going 100 miles an hour and i could see the i could see the gravel and i could see two cars in the distance on the other side i'm visioning it right now as i'm seeing it and um i start flipping I start flipping and flipping and flipping and then I could, I could feel the difference between flipping from the sand and flipping and actually hitting, the, hitting the, the road. And then I hit the first one, I'm like, 
bam. And then I'm like, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. If I hit that second one, boom, boom, boom. And suddenly, whack, and just so much power, screeching, and then boom, I land upside, right, right side up. And the first thing I did is I wiggled my toes and I went, my back's not broken. And I went six weeks before I skate again, fuck. And then I look over and there was like a, a low rider, a Mexican car looking over it towards me and just going, oh, holding their face, going, oh my God. And then I had like nurses fighting for me. I'm a nurse, you know, because these people had started stopping off, had firemen with their hoses pointed towards me, thinking I was going to go up in flames. Steering wheel was crushed in my, in my chest. Holy I had skateboards shit. all in the map. People talk about skateboarding saved their life. I'm talking skateboards actually saved my life. Right. I had, I was- You had a moving, car full of them. I had a car full of them. <laughs> and in the back, I had the videos, uh, the TVs from doing the videos. I, I right. was taking them back up north. So I, had, I was ram packed, had t-shirts everywhere. The, when the, when the uh, fire brigade were in there, they were like, Steve, is, is there anybody in the back there? You know? And um, anyway, so they had, you know, people were like, oh, this woman was going, oh, Jesus, oh, God, oh, Christ, oh, Jesus, oh, God, oh, Christ. And I was like, I said, whoever's saying, oh, Jesus, oh, God, oh, Christ, please stop it because you're not <laughs> doing me any good right now. You're not helping. I said, you open this door, you open this door, I walk away from this thing. And there was a couple of extra F-bombs in there that I tried to, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to hold keep, back. Keep it clean. Uh, anyway, so... Um, you know, they were fighting for me. They kept asking the same, what's your name? What's your date of birth? Who's the president? All this, you know, and you get to a point, my, my collarbone was broken. The only thing I could use was my right hand. My nose, I was twisting something on my nose and this, uh, this guy was like, hey buddy, uh, that's your nose. My nose would turn inside out. They did a really good job. You can't even tell. It's, wow. But it was, it was, it was basically oh, hanging off here. My face was all, all bloody. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I'm just, I'm there and they kept asking the same questions. Fireman's ho putting his hoses towards me and everything else like that. And they're like, uh, yeah, we'll get you out soon. We'll get you out soon. And they go, are you going on a helicopter? And I go, no, no, I'm, I'm scared of heights. I'm like, I don't, I'm not going to wait back on a helicopter. <laughs> not said, me, no, mate. son, you're going on a helicopter. Little did I know, when they did the Jaws of Life, they cut me out. They were ready to do surgery on the side of the freeway because I was so ram-packed in there. The steering wheel was in my chest and right. they was held in the back with bo all the boards that they thought that when they could open me up, that I would just be, I would, they would have to do surgery on me right there. So they, I found that out afterwards. Right. They put me in the helicopter and now I'm thinking Apocalypse Now. Remember the old film with the choppers? Yeah, of course, yeah. Right and this guy these. had another big mustache, like the, 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 uh, <laughs> the fireman, and he had his green helmet. He'd go, what's your name? What's your date of birth? Who's the president? I said, John Major. <laughs> and this guy was like, because he was, you know, he was checking around. He was checking all, the, he was checking all these uh, cables and everything. That is funny. And I was looking up, looking, and, and he asked me the same thing. What's your name? What's your date of birth? Because they've been asking me this about 100 times during the whole crash. Because obviously, you know, accident like that if you fall asleep you might never come out yeah sure and so this time he's like he's like ask me again <laughs> and he's what's your name what's your date of birth who's president that's john major and this time he tapped me on the shoulder he's like son we're okay we'll, we'll be at the hospital soon and i remember saying to him i said i said uh I said, I'm English. I said, John Major's the Prime Minister of England. I said, you wanted me to say old George Bushy babes, didn't you? And all I remember was this big mustache going, because <laughs> for me, I, I, was, I was fine. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't worried. I twiggled my toes and I thought, right. I'm just not going to be able to skate for six weeks. You know, I didn't realize the severity of, of it, you know? So what, what had you done? I had basically, well, it's, so I, I get into ICU and... Um, because this will kind of give you an idea of how, how, how bad I was. They said right. to me, they said, Steve, if you wake up tomorrow, don't, right. be su don't be surprised if you can't see. All right. Well, the next day, actually, I was, a lot, I was, a, I was looking a lot better because they said, it looks like you've been beaten up with a baseball bat. So the next day, my wife came, well, she was my fiance at the time, now my wife, and um, she passed out when she saw me. Right. And realized I'd got a lot better. And so when the nurses came back, I said, you know what? I was kind of disappointed. My, you know, my, I found out my fiance, she, she passed out, you know. I mean, really would wish you would have made me, you know, do a better job cleaning me up. And she quit back. She goes, well, Mr. Douglas, we're more interested in saving your life than making you look, look pretty. Wow. And uh, yeah, so and I, and, I, and I spoke to Ron Carnegie just recently and he told me, he goes, yeah, I was told that night that you weren't going to probably make it through, which was weird hearing it from yeah, him. Right. You know, because I was like, for me, there, was, there really wasn't any doubt. But I'd never heard him say that, that someone had called him and said, hey, Steve's fighting for his life. He Steve's, might not make it. Steve's going to die. So the worst thing that really happened was, I, I mean, I broke my collarbone. I had back surgery after it. I had elbow. So I had this huge hole in my elbow. They said, you're probably never going to be able to use your elbow again. But I, my biggest concern was like, how am I going to be able to, did I kill anybody? Yeah. Because I thought these two cars that I had hit were two cars. But those two cars were going 80 miles an hour too. They'd passed. What I'd actually hit, I hit a, hit a suburban truck and then I hit an 18-wheeler. Right. They said, hey, you hit, you know, you hit an 18, uh, semi truck. Uh, what's a semi truck? They're like an 18 wheeler. And I'm like, holy shit. Wow. And the fact that I hit that and then spun out and landed right side up. I mean, I was, you know, yeah. it was, it was, 
hairy, uh, hairy accidents. I was in the hospital for a week. Um, wow, and, I mean, uh, that even seems like a result. Yeah, no, I was I was very, very lucky. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, and then that just ended my career. I mean, I couldn't, I skated with a shoulder harness on there uh, after that, and my board had got stolen from the car. So I had I had wow. a brand new board and I was a real pain in the backside of boards. I'm like, you know, like if someone stole my board, that would be the end of my, my life. You know what I mean? And Which had, did happen. But getting used to the bushing. So I had a brand new board. My, the ramp had changed from one ramp to another ramp. So it'd be, it wasn't the same. And then my body was completely different. And, you know, I, I would do, you know, like a stand-up grind to me was just like, that's my go-to. That's like me dropping in. And I would fall off like 70% of my stand-up grinds. And I'd be like, my, my, my balance was completely off my body. Right. The worst thing happened to me was everything was twisted and it never went back. So now my leg is one, you know, half an inch or an inch shorter than one. My hips are slightly rotated. So my whole balance and everything is off. But I remember being after back surgery and I'm just saying, hey, look, if I can get out of this sure, and I can walk and I can feed the ducks. I mean, honestly, I was, I was like, if I, if, if I'll, I'll do a deal. If I can, you know, getting up from, I was in hospital bed for six weeks right. after the surgery. And I'm like, uh, if I can do a deal right now, I will never, ever complain. Right. And I didn't. But I, you know, that day my skateboarding died because I could never ever do it the way that I wanted to again, you know. So that was it was a it was a tough tough thing. I still I still dream about. It. I, st- I mean, I, t- I haven't skated for a while now, but I mean, I was eight years ago. I was skating two or three times a week. Right. But it's uh, it's it's never I, that in that car accident my my skateboarding died, you know, which was which is which is harsh because I'd yeah, still right. like to be able to be able to be doing all the things I did and and. Uh, was that that difficult to accept? No, because I I made it. I'd made a kind of thing with myself saying, right, I'll, you know, because I was out for you know six weeks. I mean, I couldn't even. I could get up one day, one time with, uh, uh, to go to the toilet one day, once a day. Right. And I think, okay, I'm making a little bit of improvement. I got. I wait 24 hours. You know, I could only and I couldn't lay on my sides or anything. It was it was really harsh. Yeah, yeah. And so you'd then, been through that. And, so you kind of gave six you the perspective. Weeks, I said to myself, and my, my father had had multiple sclerosis, and he couldn't. He 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 couldn't walk. So I was kind of feeling like, oh my goodness, is this, I, I now I know how he must have felt and right. how hard that was, you know. And I'm thinking, is this my version of this? And what would it be like in my life to, to be thinking that I could never walk again? You know what I mean? I was like, you know what? I'll do a deal right now and I'll take it. And right. I did a deal and I never, I've never looked back. I've never questioned it. I've just gone, you know what? It sucks, but it could have been worse. I, I didn't kill anybody. And yeah. I'm still here. And you're so, alive. Yeah. So yeah. And then it was just like, then I just threw myself in fully into to skating. I mean, I did skate a couple of events after that, but I had to wear a shoulder harness and it was just, it was just, it was, it's frustrating to not be able to do what you want to do. You yeah, know what I mean? sure. Especially at the, you know, how old were you? Uh, I, it was 24 at that point. Yeah, again. And I was still learning tricks. I was still, you know, I was still progressing. and 24. <laughs> you know, so yeah. So that was, you know, now guys are still going at 54. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was hard, but it's just, I just had to get on with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Wow. That's quite a story. Yeah, very lucky. I mean, I can. It's funny. I can't remember exactly what I did last week, but I can remember. I could write yeah, a book yeah. on, well, could, could on that car accident. You could see. I could feel it. You could see when you were telling it. You know, you were reliving it. <laughs> my my wife, as we we got out of the hotel, she got a rental car and she drove off. We were waiting for a big semi truck. I remember it. Never forget it. And she, her, uh, to get round because they were taking a while. Of this big semi truck to get onto the freeway. She went round off the, off the road and hit the gravel. Right. And I could feel the gravel. I'm, I could feel that feeling of how I felt like. Because that's how I woke up, right. like going into this gravel. I mean, I'm, I can actually feel it as I'm talking to you right now. Wow. And she was just basically rolling and just, I could feel, you know. Yeah. And for a while there, for me to actually drive past those semi-trucks was pretty intimidating. Yeah, you know, I'm really sure. Just, yeah. You know. I mean, that's, a well, obviously a life-changing experience, <laughs> but yeah. Emotionally. I still drive too fast and I still do that drive, but yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a more wary of it for sure. Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, let's bring it up to date. I reckon. Yeah, okay. So, obviously, we talked about New Deal. Yeah. You've just set up a new distribution company, right? Yeah, distribution called 1976. 1976, which is the year that I um, started skateboarding. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, having fun uh, doing that. Just taking on a couple of brands. We did Primitive. Yeah. The opportunity to do Primitive. Um, and then we we're going to be selling New Deal. When we started New Deal, I'm like, hey, I don't want anybody else selling this. Yeah, sure. So, so it, was like, it was hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're going to have a real small distribution company. I had a big company in the past with a load of brands. I don't want to be a brand builder. I want to be able to do brands and do them properly. Well, you've been there, done that, got the yeah, t-shirt. And I don't, I, yeah. So, so sold the company. Yeah. So been, I don't, I don't want to do it. I want to do something, some small brands. So there's another brand that we're talking to. Yeah. But I'm just not in a rush to go take something else on. I want to be able to work with the people that i really want to work with and be a true extension of the brand so yeah i'm really fortunate enough that i don't have to panic and we have to go get a bunch of brands but uh yeah you can do it on your own terms yeah which which, which, which is fun so it's, it's 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 very small small operation but it's, it's fun working with people you know i've got to an age now where i can work with people that i really want to work with 
You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, okay, no, I can trust this guy and this yeah. guy's really, really, really good. So, so how, how are you seeing the state of skateboarding right now? Because obviously you've got this pretty amazing overview as we've been hearing. Well, it, I think it's very, it's very difficult. I think it's very challenging. Yeah. Uh, around Big, for but the bigger than ever, you know. But bigger than ever. I mean, you know, the, the actual act of skateboarding um, is the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. In the old days, we had these uh, industry meetings and the industry meetings would be, the, you know, like the honchos of the of the big businesses getting together over a coffee, basically, and talking about the state of play. Not Never talking about pricing or anything like that, but just talking about what's going on in the industry and how can we make this better. And I remember being at the late Mike Tanowski's house um, and, you know, Bob DeKnight was there, Swank was there, Rocco was there, Paul was there. It was a bunch of heavy hitters. Jim Thibault was there. Um, and I remember getting up and going, guys, skateboarding, you know, this is like 1980, we think, where I am, 1994. And I'm going, skateboarding's rad today, but it was really inconsistent, you know what I mean? It's like everyone was riding seven and a half inch wide boards, there was 39 millimeter wheels and blank t-shirts. That was the state of play of the industry. And it was su super inconsistent. I go, look, imagine, just imagine right now, if we had had a, 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 a mini ramp scene of the, uh, of the late 80s, you know what I mean? And then a pool scene of the 70s and then, you know, like a, a jump ramp scene of the 1984 and we had, you know, this going on and slalom and freestyle and all these sort of things. Instead of skateboarding being, you know, like I'm using my hands right now this big, it, would, it could be, you know, super, it could be really far. Yeah. And really now, we're definitely at that. I mean, yeah, now sure. there's different verbs of vert skating, you know? Like when it, it's not just mega ramps, not just vert ramp, you got, you know, mini ramps, people doing slappies, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Free there's a lot of ways strong. in. There's a lot of ways in, Women's, basically. Yeah. And skate parks they're building. I mean, yeah. it's just absolutely incredible. But the actual industry, I mean, one of the sad things about SLS that I saw yesterday that was disappointing to me was, if you look at that, it's only, it's, it's, the skateboard industry that's got us to this point is not even in that. You know what I mean? None of the riders are riding. There was one guy that had a, had a Jart shirt on. But you're not seeing indie, indie shirts. You're not seeing anti-hero. You're not seeing primitive. You're not seeing the brands. You're not seeing this stuff. You know what I mean? You're only seeing Nike. You know, yeah. you're only seeing... And that breaks my heart because if it wasn't for that industry, if it wasn't for the industry that, of, of Independent and Thunder and Spitfire and stuff, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be there. And I just feel that it was my only bad thing that I thought of SLS is just like, how can you guys, you know, use the, not use, but give back to the industry that's got us to this point. You've got a great platform. You know, yeah, you're not going to put them up in there in the, with Monster and they know they pay all the money for that. But there were certain areas of the course behind the course or they could at least say, and riding for yeah. hard goods rather than just focus on Nike. So there's good things in skateboarding today. There's also bad things. I think the state of play for Skate shops is very, very, as you were asking for, is, is very, very tough. I mean, the internet's changed the game, right? Yeah, well, that's the classic thing, isn't it? You know, how do you, how do you cope with that while not alienating, you know, your traditional retail outlets? I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Like, what, what can you, how can you solve that? that it's, and it's, that very, problem, it's a very tough thing you know? for brands too. Yeah. You know, I mean, brands right now, I mean, hard good brands, it's very tough for them to make a. Uh, well, I should say, a lot of the hard good, uh, the bigger guys, it's tougher for them to make. Um, these videos and that's why it's, it's actually what's happening what we did at new deal is kind of coming back again now now yeah you know, some of these companies have got too big and too big overhead they have to do a certain amount whereas these smaller comes companies are more nimble and they can make the skate videos and stuff so i think to me it's very refreshing seeing that there's big companies going on and there's small companies that are actually making you know core skate videos again because yeah. for a while there i'm thinking like no you know for us for a board company to make a a video a skate video again it's gonna it might it might not ever happen it's gonna be down to the shoe people and i don't see people getting shoe tattoos but i see people putting indie tattoos i've seen enjoy tattoos i've seen new deals tattoos through this whole thing right yeah so it's the board companies that get people excited and i just think that the you know people like the sls and got, again those guys i can't thank them enough they were absolutely fantastic but it's like how can you incorporate the the the, the industry that's got us to this point you know and give them respect and for them to say riding for any hero or riding for baker you know it's not going to be that big of a deal in my opinion yeah, and if someone told them they couldn't, then you then that, that's a problem to me. You we know should I mean? be able to do both. Exactly. I mean, and also it's funny, isn't it? Because we're obviously of the generation that it was quite self policing, wasn't it? You know, when those brands all came in, mm. everybody was quite prote protective of like skate culture, and it was it was quite a clear thing of like, let's remember who we are, let's remember what these brands represent, and let's not just sell out to these bigger brands. But now, obviously, that's kind of old fashioned. It's yeah. gone completely differently, as you're talking about. I mean, do you think that that path is inevitable? Do you think as something like skateboarding just gets to the size that it's got and you get these new generations coming in, do you think it's actually, do you think there's any way you can avoid this situation? It's a tough one. I mean, it's, it's a tough one for the shops. It's also tough for the, you know, like I said, it's tough for the brands too. The brands are trying to sell their, their product in. 
and they're competing with a lot of shops that've got their own brand with their own they're trying to be their own brand which I totally get too you yeah know? so it's just really really tough and obviously a lot of the brands now are going direct to consumer which yeah. the shops aren't happy about of course but then not. on the other side of it is the shops saying the, the, the distributors saying to the shop well you're not supporting my brand yeah what do I do you know so you know you've got pressure from the from the brands telling the distributors to sell more product um, so it's, it's difficult it's difficult and the, the chains are getting bigger and the small ones are uh, small skate shops which is what it's all about um, so you know we do need a lot more we do need more skateboarders coming in and hopefully with the Olympics regardless of what you think about the Olympics yeah. it's coming in and hopefully that's going to bring a whole new supply of skate, skateboarders that are going to you know end up going to a, finding a skateboard somehow and then end up going to um, a skate shop and then hopefully being a um, you know so hopefully this Olympic thing could be a big big push for a lot of independent sh shops you know yeah I, I really hope so because they are the lifeblood of, 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 the, of the industry yeah so what can what can skateboarding do to kind of prepare for that in a positive way well I think that's a, I mean it's a good question I, I mean I, I, when I've traveled around the UK and I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of older shop owners maybe a bit jaded by it and kind of focusing on other things and i see a lot of young guys with a lot of energy doing really involved with the with the local community working with the uh working with uh, the skate parks having big teams doing demos and everything else like that and having camps and teaching kids how to skate i mean i think that whole thing you know the shops have got to be involved in the scene right you've got to be yeah and and, and, well, again, and most of these guys are which it's is, skate, that is skateboarding isn't it yeah which, which, which is great you know yeah. i mean i thought that the outpouring with with ben and the skate run, you know, the shops coming out and just sort of saying, "Hey, look, we're here to listen to you. If you've got mental problems, you've got any problems going yeah. on right now, come in and speak." I mean, that's like such a beautiful thing, a touching thing to see that because that's what the the core skate shop is. And I want to try as, as much as I can to help the core skate shops survive because that's so important to have that meeting point where you can go meet at the shop, sit on the couch, watch, you know, watch video, and then go skate. You know, it's such an important part. But it's tough. It's definitely yeah. tough. It's not going to be. It's not going to get easier for them unless we do have a bunch more people riding skateboards. Yeah. And hopefully that's gonna that's gonna help. Yeah. This has been great, Steve. I've got one more for you. We've, okay. We sailed past the hour that we uh, that okay. we talked about. Um, but you know, it's been brilliant hearing all the stories and and the overview. I guess the question would be like, what what are you proudest of out of that whole that whole lot? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think four one one. Didn't even ask you about four one one. Yeah, four one one because. I'm mean, very lucky to just, just drop that in. <laughs> be able to, um, to to have a great life. Uh, I've been over to you know moved over to America basically in 1985, but I've also missed out on a lot of things. You know, nieces and nephews and, and brothers and sisters getting married and best friends and all that sort of stuff. And so I wouldn't change any of that. Um, but I felt that I didn't want people to have to do that. You know, at the time it was like you've got to go to California. And even for the East Coast guys, you've got to go to California. There is the path. You've got there. to make that, and that's yeah. what you've got to do. And with four on one, it was basically, if it's good, it goes in. There was no politics with four on one. If someone didn't advertise, we didn't hold them back what happened with some of the other magazines. Right? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, this guy's going to get the cover. Oh, he's meant to get the cover. Oh, well, he's not advertising with us, so let's put someone else on the cover. I mean, that's bullshit. Yeah. You know? But it was the way it was. That's the way it was. Yeah. So with four on one, it was like, hey, if it's good, it goes in. And we got, we got a hard time at four on one. Four on one gets all this credit today. But yeah. we got a lot of hard time from the industry going, you're putting Johnny No Name in it. And I'm going, guys, I'm emailing you every time, every, every month saying, we need footage, give us footage. We're working with the footage that we have, right? But one of the things that we wanted to do was like the retrospective and, and doing things on cities and then doing the world report, right? And doing the world report was giving people an opportunity to be able to be show skateboarding all over the world yeah. to give them a path and, and we hooked up cameras like French Fred got a camera from us and um, so that was what well, I'm most Colin proud Kennedy, of I mean I interviewed Colin I mean right so, so we, we try to we try, yeah. to we try to do that and with the ethos of you know ethos of just if you're good it goes in yeah. I don't care where you're from I don't care anything I don't care if you're sponsored or whatever if you're good enough to do that trick and you make it if you think about it the, how many covers have we seen over the years how many photos have we seen where you're like did he make that yeah but in four and one, you knew that he made it, and yeah. you could see him how he rode out of it, good or bad, right? Yeah. But it was good; it goes in, and that's and that's what I'm most proud about because I think that changed skateboarding in a way that you could be Lucas, for example, and go, yeah, I'm going to go to America a little bit, but I'm going to stay in France, yeah, and good, and and she should be able to enjoy his mother and father and, yeah, and friends yeah. and family, you know yeah. what I mean? And so, yeah, if there's one thing I'm most proud of, is four and one because of that ability of what we did and what we what what, what we did, and um, yeah, and, and, and that couldn't have been done without without Andy Howe and that couldn't have been done without Josh Freeberg and it couldn't be done without Paul Schmidt and it couldn't be done without Tim Layton Boyce yeah. because Tim Layton Boyce gave me the idea of a video magazine and in my mind he was thinking 
video grabs and putting it on magazine because that's what basically it was because at that time well that was the sequence wasn't it the sequence you yeah. take 100 rolls of film not yeah, yeah. trick right so film it and then keep running over it and, and that's what it was and so that's you know that's for another story of, about how that all came about but yeah for one no doubt that is my most proudest thing because it allowed people to have a life and just be a great skateboarder I mean you know and to do things like the industry sections like with the, in the flip part was one of the best parts when I think back of Form 1 that flip part was was fantastic well it's like you say there's so many legendary parts in it you know that became the, the legends didn't they became yeah. the stories you yeah. know and then on video on video it was, it was even in my opinion a lot better but it just yeah. was, was ahead of the time but anyway I appreciate it I don't want to take too much more of your time and your listeners time no man it's been great I mean I, I, I'm just going to say one thing it seems like all the way through it all the stories that you, that you tell in all the, the different things it seems like there's always been quite a a theme of like trying to change it up you know what I mean like you, even when you just talk about 411 New Deal is that has that been quite purposeful of like seeing it and thinking like, well, we don't need to do it like that. We could do it how better. Do we, yeah, how do we improve it? Yeah, has that always been a yeah, thing? As, as, a, as a skateboarder, it was always like, how am I going to improve it? And it's yeah. funny, I have a friend that I've just connected back onto uh, um, in uh, in skateboarding over here. I, I grew up with and he remember, he, he said he, what, he was watching me skate at Harrow and he goes, if my dad saw you skate, he would laugh at you. But if my dad saw my friend Shithead who was doing six foot front side airs, he goes, he'd ask for his autograph. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not skating for your dad. I'm skating for me. You know what I mean? That's what's so great about skateboarding. And I had, that was always through my life. People telling me I'm skateboarding wrong. Uh, when you go to America, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to do this. And I'm just sitting there going, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't skateboard for you. I was skateboarding for me. Right. And so everything I've tried to do, I've tried to be like, how, do, I mean, how, how am I going to make this better and everything else like that? So, and it's just coming from skateboarding. It's like, you know, when you do that first grind, I want to do that grind longer. If I do that first ollie, I want to do that. How do I do it uh, longer? You know, higher. How do I do the air better? You know what I mean? And, and, and I think I just try to look at that in the same way of businesses, if anything I'm going to try and do is going, how am I going to make it be the best this can be? You know, yeah. how do we make today be better than it was yesterday? And so never being satisfied. And I believe me, if you ask Josh Freeberg and the guys at Form <laughs> One, I used to get, I used to get the video sent to me on a Friday and I would rip it to shreds <laughs> and they would say to me, Steve. And I go, you know, what's good. Yeah. I go, the opportunity is how do we make this better? You know, that's the opportunity here is like, yeah, it's good, but someone else, you know, let's, let's make it as better, as, as good as it possibly can be. Yeah. And that was always, you know, like, that's where you get the opportunity is going, yeah, yeah it's nice to get an ego stroke. Yeah, you, it's the best, it's the best. You know, I mean, I, what, Chris Carter, a guy I had total respect for from Alien Workshop, he watched the first couple of issues of Form 1 and he said, Steve, great product, but I'm never going to advertise. Right. Right. And I, and I went, that's okay, cool. So when he did advertise, I said, Chris, <laughs> Chris. I said, you know how hard we've worked so that one day this time would come up that you did advertise? I go, you made us be a better, kind of like the, my pod conversation. Yeah. Right? I can see where that, you know, and I'm like, you've made us be better. I go, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the top spot, the first ad in the magazine at the same price because you've helped me out and you've helped Form 1 out because that you said to me you wouldn't be in it. Yeah, and it made. I didn't tell anybody, like, oh, we've got we to get him in. I'm just like, okay, we've got to make it hard enough. We've got to make it so good that he's going to have to be in it. Yeah. And that's what he did. And that's what we did. And then it was, that was cool. That, that was a, a good feeling of like, wow, we did that. And that was a good push for the, for the crew, you know? Yeah. So. Man, that's been epic. So there you go. That was me and Steve Douglas. Hope you enjoyed it. Really good laugh hanging out with Steve for the day. After this was recorded, we went to Stockwell Skate Park just around the corner. Did some pics with Owen Tozer before. Well, heading to the pub for a few beers and more conversations, as is often the way. Reckon we could have got a, another solid few hours out of that really but if you enjoyed this one make sure you keep an ear out for steve's nine club which will be coming later this year and no doubt featuring all the stories he didn't have a chance to talk about this time around and if you haven't already checked out the new deal reissue then make sure you do so by heading on over to new deal skateboards over on instagram or checking out andy howell's nine club episode where he talks about it it's been brilliant to see how well it's gone down and you could tell from our conversation how stoked about this Steve was. Another way you can find out more, head to my Instagram at We Look Sideways, where my friends at Read and Destroy have been kind enough to send me some Steve Douglas pics from the archive, which I've got Steve to comment on in uh, one of the posts you're going to see up there. Go and check them out. Give them a like if you enjoyed the episode and uh, check it out for more insight from Steve, basically. While you're at it, I would, of course, be very grateful if you could express your general enjoyment of the podcast in the usual ways, sharing via Instagram, Facebook or Twitter, reviewing on iTunes, or even buying some merchandise from the shop on my website over at www.wearelookingsideways.com. So housekeeping corner, what's been going on? I had an interesting one, actually. 
um, my friend Matt George, photographer, is doing another project. And he's basically asked me to help him with that, which is nice. Might be doing a bit more writing there. Keep you updated when that comes out. And in the last episode, I was talking about how me and Owen are trying to um, put this book together, do a launch, do a live podcast, all that. Might have found a venue in London. So looking at kind of October time, I think, for that one. That'll give us enough time to get the books done print up the shots of Owens for the gallery part and for me to book a live guest so yeah um, I will of course keep you posted I'll be back next week with another episode and hopefully the launch of type 2 in the meantime thanks for listening and I'll catch you then nice one (laughs) 